We are very pleased to have you here today to discuss the latest research, share knowledge, and exchange ideas on conservation and management of muskellunge in the upper St. Lawrence River. Our goal today is to equip fellow anglers with, that, that are passionate about muskellunge with the required knowledge and strategies to promote long-term sustainability. Our guest speakers today are authorities in their respective fields and will discuss challenges, solutions, and future opportunities for our river. We hope that you will find the workshop educational and informative as we work towards sustaining our unique aquatic environment on the international St. Lawrence River. And now over to uh, Red Brick, Ryan Lambie, and of course, Dr. Farrell. Um, as we introduce Dr. Farrell, uh, I think that um, there's the, we're we're really honored uh, that you know John Farrell is a professor in aquatic and fisheries science at the Thousand Islands Biological Station, which is part of the uh, environmental science and forestry uh, sector of the State University for New York uh, in Syracuse. And Tibbs, as we call it affectionately, ha has done a tremendous amount to advance muskie science. Uh, we've been able to work very closely. Muskies Canada has, is, is very limited in its professional science capacity, but by partnering in with institutions like Tibbs and Queen's University and the River Institute and uh, a number of other uh, science-based organizations, and especially the ministry, um, we're able to kind of contribute to or support or work towards uh, really good science. Um, I'm really pleased uh, to mention specifically uh, that uh, Dr. Farrell uh, was inducted into the Muskies Canada Hall of Fame. Uh, so he will be getting his Hall of Fame trophy. Very nice. <laughs> I'm I'm blown away. Thanks, Peter. And I'd like to also mention uh, John Anderson, who was also inducted into the Muskies Canada Hall of Fame. So congratulations, John. <laughs> um, well merited. So, Dr. Thank Farrell, um, uh, over to you. It's your show, and and uh, we'll just uh, we'll we'll be listening carefully. And uh, if there's an opportunity for comments and discussion, that's great. It's all yours. Thank you, John. Wow, thank you, Peter, and everyone. I'm I'm just blown away by that. That's unexpected. What a what a nice uh, honor to receive. I, uh, you know, I know there's a long list of uh, distinguished uh, people um, that have been inducted into that um, honor, and uh, just to have my name in there is just uh, humbling. So, you know, thanks so much. You guys are. It's just a wonderful uh, group of people to work with. I think we're we're blessed um, when I look at. Uh, some other fisheries and management challenges. You know, I just, I think that, uh, you know, the group that revolves around the management of muskies and the sausage just is uh, really, there's none better. Um, you know, there's true partnership between uh, the the science and management and the, the stakeholder groups that work so closely and well together, you know, it's uh, a real honor. So thanks so much for that, everybody. Um, I'm gonna move, Onto my talk here. So let me uh, bring it up. I got a lot of things up on my screen. I got to pick the right one. Let's see. Let's see. Just a second. <clears throat> just while we're doing that, uh, just a couple of housekeeping things. We are recording. Uh, if you're not one of the presenters, please mute so the audio quality is better. If you've got questions, you can put them into the chat section. We'll try to catch them all. Uh, we're probably going to do questions near the end of presentations uh, as opposed to throughout uh, presentations. And given that everybody's working on a Saturday, we're all going to be uh, uh, great about the questions we ask. Hmm. Just a moment. I do a, a lot of work on Zoom, so I'm, that's why I'm surprised I'm uh, <laughs> having a, a little difficulty here. Uh, huh. I, 
there it is. Okay, we can see that. So is that full screen? We guys? Yes, it is now, full screen now. Great. So uh, yeah, thanks again uh, for the opportunity. I really look forward to the discussions this morning in the workshop. Uh, this is a, a picture from uh, one of our young technicians who uh, is obviously pretty thrilled to be handling that fish from the uh, St. Lawrence and our spring uh, sampling last year. Um, so again, uh, just moving into it, I, you know, to get that honor, it's really awesome to be inducted into the Hall of Fame, but obviously I don't do all this work myself and it would be completely impossible to do without like all the collaboration in teams. Like uh, as we speak, I think there's like three or four grad students and a number of undergrads that are up at Tibbs this morning, you know, working in the field <laughs> as usual. And we, we hired uh, eight um, undergrad technicians uh, working with the group this year. And I think there's five graduate students and, you know, we're just uh, gearing up for another, uh, wonderful another uh, wonderful season working on the river um they're doing a pike egg take today for a, a separate study so we you know just to let everybody know we work with uh you know monitoring uh water chemistry lower trophic levels uh, aquatic habitat wetlands muskrat populations we we did a we do a big muskrat survey in the winter um and uh there's uh a lot of research on uh walleye um and, and uh, bass and pike and really all the all the fishes and um, even goes beyond that. We've, we've had studies working on um, the herpa fauna and the birds and, you know, so that I really felt that the biological station needs to be a real uh, place where, you know, anybody could come to do uh, biological work that would help with conservation of the St. Lawrence. And, you know, uh, the program's really uh, built out of the Muskie project and, you know, there's some some people that came before me that really uh, helped lay the the foundation. And, uh, you know, all these so many partners, you know, I don't think I've nearly listed them all um, make it a really exciting group to work with. And we're, I think it's like the golden age. There's there's just so much uh, good work going on. You know, you're going to hear from Matt and Colin and, you know, everybody is uh, working to advance uh conservation and you know we've got some serious issues that we're facing so it's a good thing that we have these partnerships to um, to move forward and make progress um the other thing we have is uh you know i like to review the the international management plan and give some updates on that so you've seen this slide um you know we we continue to report in the lower left hand corner if you want to see the, the the fairly dry reports that are written um that really cover, uh, you know, all aspects of assessment and monitoring of uh, Lake Ontario and the Upper St. Lawrence, um, and, and many other topics. You know, go to the uh, the Great Lakes Fisheries Commission Lake Ontario unit reports. Um, I think the report from last year was put up about a month ago. So there's it's just laden with information and the uh, and the hard work that. Uh, that agency and, and some science uh, and university scientists uh, post up there. Um, so, you know, we have a working group and uh, to manage the sausages and the system, you know, we're, we're, uh, we meet usually once a year, but when things are going well, it was not always once a year, um, but we, you know, follow things like biological data and monitoring and uh, protecting critical habitat and improving fisheries management. Uh, under the Muskie management plan. So that that process continues and you can see our the goals of the fishery haven't really changed. We might need to update our management plan. I think we're just so busy. We've been a little behind on that, but it's still, we know that these goals are gonna stay, which is like trying to promote and maintain a self-sustaining uh, population, you know, really focusing on the eco ecological role of that apex predator in the river. It wouldn't be the same without it and, and supporting a, a quality uh, trophy muscalon fishery that our stakeholders and uh, the economics and the community all enjoy um, the use of that resource. So, um, you know, in terms of like updates, I think there's been uh, 
kind of a wholesale change of regulations uh, in, in New York State, excuse me, and um, they they moved uh, the opening day of muscalange uh, to coincide with the opening day of bass, which it always was. But now they, they instead of like doing the like the third Saturday approach, it's now um, June fifteenth. Um, so and it's a fixed date, so it's opening June fifteenth. Um, you know, we're in discussions with uh, with DEC, and we'll probably bring this up at the next meeting because that's a pretty early um, date. Um, so that that might be something that would be worth talking about, but uh, um, because uh, the spawning period is, we, I do have records of muscalunge spawning um, even later than that date, uh, and uh, you know if you look at the uh, the way the third Saturday in June used to migrate across the calendar, you know the 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 June fifteenth is about as early as it could have been in the past. So and they fixed it at that date. So I have. You know, I want to look at the information and, you know, make sure we're protecting muscalunge during spawning. But right now that's been a, a change that was done um, by DEC. Uh, we're supposed to have common regulations between um, as part of the, man the international management. And uh, so that's something that, you know, we'll have to consider um, and, and make recommendations on. So that's uh, an update on management. Um, today, this is kind of what I wanted to cover. And I... I was talking with Peter before the meeting started, and he suggested that we have more of a discussion format instead of me talking the entire time. And you know, I think we'd. Uh, so if there's there's areas that you want to pop in and ask questions about, or I might ask questions of you, we'll we'll stop and have a little discussion. It's possible we won't get through the the presentation, but I thought having that interaction would probably be beneficial. Uh, so I I hope to go over uh, what's going on with the Musclelunge Recovery Program. Uh, give you an update on that. And then th there's going to be some changes to the culture program I wanted to discuss with you. So uh, most of you are well aware that we're um, doing experimental uh, stocking of muskie to try to uh, restore uh, spawning and uh, nursery populations that have been impacted by some of the ecological changes in the river. Uh, and then we've employed a, a citizen science program that was launched last year um, to help uh, build better um, connections between angling and angling groups and um, data collection that might help inform the success of that program. Um, and then there's a new project that's been funded uh, that we put together with a group of partners, really exciting. And, and we're gonna be using the uh, the acoustic array and, and putting out some tags on muscalunge uh, beginning in 2023. And another part of that that's really exciting is we're, we're working with uh, a geneticist. So there's gonna be some really advanced conservation genetics applied to the entire uh, conservation effort. So I'll give you an update on those things. So Peter mentioned the, the conservation status and that we're up against things. You know, sometimes I bring out all our, I have some of our index data, but um, you know, that basically there's been a, a big decline in the spawning populations. We, I've got a little bit of work that we did recently with some eDNA and some other sampling methods that I'll show you, but there's been very low levels of, um, young of the year production. So we're we're concerned about recruitment. You know, the, the fishery is being monitored as well. I've got a little bit of information on that today. Um, there's, you know, been this VHSV outbreak and that kind of reared its ugly head last year. Um, you know, we uh, I think had like half a dozen adults that were, that were found dead in the river and um, some groups really worked hard to uh, recover some of those individuals. There was one individual that ended up um, being tested and tested positive uh, down at Cornell um, that was found in the Lake St. Lawrence area last April, about a year ago. And uh, I have a student who's actually doing um, like some really advanced uh, uh, sequencing work, uh, looking at like the evolution of that virus um, in fish populations and kind of testing the, the idea that the, the round goby are like the key reservoir for the virus in the St. Lawrence River. 
Um, and so, you know, one of the concerns is, is that this is a rhabdovirus and that it's changed. And if, if it changes enough, it can elicit, uh, you know, a new round of uh, mortality on muscolin. So that's, that's what we're really concerned about and watching. So I think everybody uh, needs to be vigilant on the water this year um, for, for seeing if, and, and we really do need uh, like what's called uh, moribund fish. So these are, if you see fish that are still barely alive or very recently uh, deceased, you know, those are the ones that they, they need to, uh, to, you know, do the testing work. Uh, if it's a, a fish that's decomposed, you know, I think we can just collect some basic data on it. It'd be good to get a length, you know, possibly, uh, you know, record the location, um, take a photo and, uh, let, let, uh, you know, either the, the, uh, resource managers know about it, Colin or Jana Lantry on the, the U S side or, or me and, or anyone else, so it gets into the network that we know that 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 was a, a mortality event that we need to think about. Um, so yeah, we're we're uh, tracking this uh, mortality, uh, and then again, there's been low levels of success, um, and and that could also be due to uh, predation by invasive round goby. So we that day and um, events that we're on on a species, including uh, muscalange and, and uh, goby egg predation. Hey, John, I don't know if you can hear us. We're, uh, you're breaking up a little bit. I'm wondering if maybe if you turn off your video, it might uh, improve the quality of your audio. You guys got me back. Yep. I'm wondering if uh, you turn off your camera, it might include the uh, improve the vol the quality of your audio. Sure. Was I breaking up a little bit? We probably lost about uh, the last sixty seconds or so. Oh. Okay, that's unfortunate, <laughs> but. Um... So anyhow, I was just talking about some of these factors related to the uh, the population uh, status, and um, you know, one of the the issues is VHSV, obviously. And we had, I think, you heard the part about um, trying to monitor uh, and being vigilant for any dead muscalunge this year. Did you guys hear that one? We did hear that. Yeah, we okay, did. Good. John, we've lost your screen sharing, though. OK, so uh, if you huh. can see if we can get that uh, back up. Yeah, sorry about that. I must be, you know, I'm at home and my Internet is acting up. Um, let's see. There we go. We can see it. Got now. it back. Yep. Good. <laughs> yeah. If, if any time, you know, uh, there's a problem, just let me know. But uh, we were talking about this, this round goby egg predation and how we have done some experiments and they, these uh, gobies can find the eggs in um, really a, a complex habitats uh, quite rapidly. And then, you know, we're also seeing changes in nursery habitat. So, we monitor the habitat quality of nursery areas um, in the system. And one of the uh, things we're concerned about is that there's a uh, water soldier has uh, been detected in the Bay of Quinney region. So it's an invasive uh, macrophyte uh, that, that takes over and out competes uh, our native habitat. And that it, it kind of attacks areas and spreads uh, in areas that might be quality musky nursery habitat. So that's something that I'm concerned about. You know, it moved out of the Trent Severin system. Um, I think there were numerous groups that for, gosh, eight, nine years have been trying to eradicate it in that system and had, have been really aggressive. But it looked like uh, that that uh, plant species has moved downstream and is now in the Bay of Quinney. So it's, it's posed, it's really uh, poised to, move into the Thousand Islands area and maybe downstream um, 
in the in the St. Lawrence River. So it's something I'm really concerned about uh, looking looking out for this water soldier invasion and how it might impact our musky nursery sites. Just like we need another thing, right? And uh, but hopefully that won't play out uh, and become like a, a a big time issue for critical musky habitat. But it's something we gotta uh, watch closely. Um, see there we go so yeah we continue to monitor the the fishery through our diary program so this is uh the update it includes the 2022 uh angling season so you know we have the effort here and you can see effort uh has this interesting variability in it um so that's the number of angler hours and you can see the effort uh plummeted uh way down here in 2022. Anybody want to guess why that is? I'm sure you can guess. <laughs> low, low water, right? <laughs> so I, I think that the, the reduction in effort is uh, related to the extremely low water levels that we had last fall. We had several diaries return that people just had to pull their boats and didn't get out. So uh, for those who did get out, they I think they had pretty good fishing. Um, you know, you can see this long term trend where we had like uh, really high uh, catch rates um, in the early 2000s and then it made a, a big decline and we've kind of been bouncing around. But you can see since uh, 2016, it's kind of been on a slight rise. So, you know, the fishery seems to be hanging in there and, and, and doing pretty well, at least according to our diary program that I mean, this sort of data comes with a lot of uh, caveats. Of course, there's there's people that have uh, come in and out of the program. Um, there's just a few people that have been in it for most of the entire data set, but uh, it's really useful in engaging uh, where we are. Um, if we get up uh, our management goals here at uh, 0 0.1 uh, fish per hour or one musk lunge per, per 10 hours fish. So that's the, the management goal. And, uh, you know, we're, we're not really at that, but it's it's fluctuating. And we we actually have anglers that uh, do better than this. And if if they're like new to the program, we keep that information like out of the the long term index. And we we have uh, people that focus in Lake St. Lawrence. So you know, catch rates uh, vary by individual and location in the river, as you guys know. But this we try to keep this as standard as possible. To, to, to try to monitor, you know, kind of the, the average fishery. And this, this is what we're seeing. And then I just, you know, wanted to mention that we have, that we work collaboratively with a, a number of groups on the U.S. side through this fish habitat conservation strategy. So there's a focus on um, improving fish habitat, reproductive habitat, and we focus on uh, walleye, northern pike, and musk lunge in this process. So there's there's projects that go on to try to improve uh, habitat and, and also do uh, research and management related to uh, habitat conservation. So I just wanted to stick that in there. This has been going on and it's funded through the uh, dam relicensing funds that are managed by the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. But we, we work closely with DEC and other groups um, uh, that that can actually do things, uh, and a lot of it's been targeting um, uh, northern pike and walleye habitat. But we do have uh, musky projects as well. Um, I mentioned, uh, like going back to some of the the monitoring, uh, we have a a, a number of uh, sites that we monitor. Uh, annually for spawning adult muscalunch. Um, and these are the index, we call these the index bays. And, and this data here uh, really shows uh, kind of the, the decline um, or, or post, post VHSD decline uh, status of some of these bays. So um, you may have heard of uh, Blind Bay here in the news. This is the one that uh, is uh, being looked at and is a uh, threat for development here. And they're trying to uh, work to uh, protect that site. And uh, it used to be one of the most prolific uh, spawning areas in the uh, Clayton area. Um, and uh, I think we've handled, you know, something like 120 muscalunge at this site over the years. And then we, we had a decline 
um, in, in those adults around the Blind Bay area, which is near Fisher's Landing. And, uh, you know, we, we started looking at them, you know, wondering if the trap nets might be avoided and how effective they are. So we started doing spotlight sur surveys during the spawning run and, uh, you know, looking for these fish and we didn't really see anything. And then we, we actually worked with uh, one of our graduate students developed uh, an eDNA assay for muscalone. So we actually did water sampling and, and some good news came out of it. We, we, we found that uh, many of these sites that have had kind of sporadic uh, detections with trap nets and spotlighting, um, we, we really need to add seining in here as well as an indicator of reproductive success and the presence of muskie. But when we looked at DNA, it told us that there were muscalunge that still existed in the site that we weren't effectively sampling. So um, with the exception of one site at Payos Bay down near Cape Vincent, um, they uh, we weren't able to detect anything. So this this site looks like muscalunge had truly been extirpated from Payos Bay uh, down near Cape Vincent, but we were able to detect musky DNA at these other sites. So it means that they they possibly still exist in those places, which is which is kind of good news. We we're glad to hear that, but they're really low abundance. Um, so those are some of the justifications uh, for why we've like gone into a, a musky recovery program. So we're in the uh, through five years, believe it or not, of a muscalunge population enhancement study, uh, and so we we've been releasing fry and fingerling muscalunge into uh, a number of nursery sites uh, along the, the U.S. side of the, the St. Lawrence River and, and also in eastern Lake Ontario. Uh, and, and we're trying to focus on restoration of, of populations and, and enhance like natural reproduction in these sites. So we do uh, rootstock collections. This is, this is a picture from uh, last spring. Um, nice day. Uh, and here's uh, JP LeBlanc and Scott Schluter. And I think that's Justin Ecrit from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and myself um, taking uh, eggs from uh, spawning muscalunge. And I think this day we were uh, downriver uh, near the Robert Moses Saunders Dam and, and uh, really caught some nice fish and, and were able to to uh, exceed our, I think we tripled our quota. And you'll hear more about that in a moment. But we we bring the fish back to the Tibbs lab, incubate the eggs. Um, we do a, a fry stocking. So this is an advanced fry muscalunge. And then we we also have been raising uh, larger fingerlings um, and, and inserting a, a pit tag into those fish. So this is a, an example of uh, muscalunge being intensively cultured in our, in our raceway. Um, and some of you, I think, came out for a visit uh, last year to see the, the operation. So, you know, there's a lot of uh, research and monitoring that's going on. Um, and I'm going to give you some highlights uh, here in a moment. So this is not a great slide, but I threw it together from some of our reports. Uh, and what's interesting is this is our, our brood stock uh, and our, our adult index data um, just from last year. So you can look at the these are the sites that are trap netted. Um, we have index sites and then we have roving sites where we're, we're looking for getting new information. So we, we uh, increased our roving sites in Eastern Lake Ontario last year. Um, and uh, we also work with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. They, they do uh, the sturgeon work down at the uh, near the Robert Moses Saunders Power Dam. And um, they're, we, we're working in the Lake St. Lawrence region. Um, and and we work closely with them and they run nets uh, during weekdays down um, at these sites in Lake St. Lawrence. And they uh, really crushed them. So you can see like this effort here of 621 net nights in uh, the TI and Eastern Lake Ontario region for a capture of six muscalunge. You know, 0 0.01 is the catch per unit effort, catch per net night. Um, not not doing very well there, you know, lots of zeros in this database and a couple of pairs here and there. Um, and uh, then when we looked at uh, Lake St. Lawrence, the, the effort was much less, 49 that nights, and they caught uh, 15 muscalunge. So the, the CUEs through the roof. So it's just this fantastic year. Um, so a lot of these fish were used in, in this past year's broodstock collection. We did get some eggs from the TI region as well. Um, 
And uh, we, we've done genetics work, so we know that the genetics of these fish are very, very similar. Um, so there's no reservations about, um, you know, using Lake St. Lawrence uh, in other parts of the St. Lawrence River. Um, and it, we're kind of, you'll hear more about that genetic study in a moment. But this is kind of, you know, our long-term index of the, the TI region. Um, and you can see that, you know, we used to have much higher catch per unit effort, you know, even greater uh, in, in 2003. And then BHSV, we've seen this kind of decline. So this is a really basic data set. So, you know, we continue to see pretty low levels in our spawning index. So that's not being necessarily reflected in the fishery too much, but, you know, we, we're concerned that the, the recruitment at, to the the population is is declined, and, and that's part of the research that's going on. Um, let's see. So the, this is a, a, a map of the experimental stocking locations. So you're, so you're going from Eastern Lake Ontario through all these sites on the U.S. side. There's a lot of great sites around Grindstone Island here, um, and then Eel Bay, and then along the U.S. mainland. Um, and then we're, we're also getting some sites down here uh, near Waddington in the Lake St. Lawrence area. So we're we we do a stocking early of these uh, advanced fry, and we've been studying these. Uh, uh, we we follow up, and you're going to hear about that assessment work. And then here's a picture of one of the fingerlings that was released. They're they're minnow finished, so they these this one probably just ate a few minnows, and that's why it looks so fat. But uh, you know we really want the river to grow these fish out, so we're not you know stocking excessive sizes. So we try to get them into the river early, so they have. Uh, a period of time where they can grow. And we really want these fish to imprint on the site so we can detect them uh, later on as adults. And, and uh, we'll get to that in a moment. So here's uh, some of the, the stocking information that's gone on for the study. Uh, so these these are advanced fry stock. Uh, we, we really did well in um, 2021 um, and, and 2022 is the first year that we've had a, a really full complement of uh, advanced fry and fingerlings. Um, so we, we had good fingerling success uh, back in 2017. So these fish are now uh, going to be six years old. Uh, so they should start to enter. If some of them survive, we should start to be able to detect these. Um, we had a smaller number in 2019, but like I said, we have a quota of about 6,000, and I think it's actually 5,300, and we we actually did really, really well this year um, and, and released over 18,000 fall fingerlings, um, and then this is the total number stocked. Here's a picture of some of the, the fall fingerlings. I think these were caught during assessment, actually, so these were, were caught by seining. Um, so you're going to hear from from Matt and you know he he provides a really useful piece of information because Matt is working in sites that aren't receiving um, any stocking where we we are working in sites where we're uh, doing one survey uh, that assesses the uh, fry stocking and then we do a later survey uh, in the fall that assesses the fingerlings when they go out in uh, around September first. Okay. So again, post-stocking evaluation, all those fry are immersed in uh, OTC. It's a, it's a chemical uh, oxytetracycline um, and it, it puts a, a fluorescent band. So when you remove the otolith bone from the fish and you transmit ultraviolet light through it on a, on a special microscope, it'll, it'll actually glow and tell us that that fish came from our laboratory. So we take pretty small samples because we value the muskies so much. But we were able to determine if if the fish came uh, from our lab or not. The unfortunate part is, is you have to sacrifice the fish, sacrifice the fish to get this bone. Then that's for the fry, and then for the uh, uh, fingerlings. You know they're getting this eight millimeter pit tag. So these fish are being released, and then uh, we're doing assessment work primarily by seining uh, to determine how they're doing. And then you know after they uh, uh, kind of grow and and they'll leave these uh, nursery areas as juveniles uh, after their first year, and then we won't see them again uh, until adulthood. So that's uh, important. So this is uh, 
our long-term saning index. Uh, we can see this is our catch per sane haul. And uh, we have two types of sanes. There's a small fine mesh sane, and then there's a larger uh, 60 foot sane. So that's twice the size. Um, so we're, we're actually uh, monitoring each one of these data points uh, represents about nine. It is exactly 90 sane halls uh, that are completed in 11 sites throughout the region. Um, and you can see, you know, the effect, this is what we we're really concerned about, this big drop in uh, reproduction uh, that was seen in the mid 2000s. And, and also the, just the continuation of that. Um, and you can see we did an experimental fry stocking at four sites. So this is four sites of fry stocking that were done in 2013, 14, and 15 that were a pilot study to what we're doing now. And then we're we're also seeing you know the fry stocking of 2021 and 2022. So you can see the influence that fry stack stocking had on the the catch per unit effort of of muskie. So it, it went way up. Um, so you know that's that's pretty exciting. But what we're kind of concerned about is that uh, you know we're not seeing um, quite as much survival as what we saw historically. So I don't have this data here, but I did uh, experimental fry stocking as part of a separate project to study muscalunge in 1990 through 96. Uh, so this 96 data point is actually a year that was fry stocked. Um, and uh, there were years before that that aren't shown in the data. So we have this baseline of what uh, fry stocked muscalunge uh, should perform in terms of uh, survival. And we're not quite seeing we're seeing a, a, a significant benefit, but it's not quite as good as what we saw in the 1990s. So then I think I, I mentioned that we're doing some other uh, sampling as well. So we, we retained uh, 14 muskie for the OTC evaluation. Um, we're still working on that right now. Uh, and then we uh, say in these index areas and uh, we, we uh, found that uh, 35 or 47 of the, the fish uh, that were wanded were tagged. So there was a high rate of uh, fingerling uh, prevalence in the, in the system. Um, so this July survey, we caught 35 muskie that were likely almost entirely uh, related to the fry stocking program. Um, and because uh, the fingerlings were stocked later, uh, we we caught 12 of those uh, in the August survey. And then what was really exciting is we, we did a survey in October and November, and we caught 46 muskies. Uh, and that was in half the number of sites. So, you know, it told us that even though we're, you know, seeing kind of fairly low levels here, we are detecting muskellunge beyond what we just see with wildfish. Uh, we saw this huge spike. Um, in the fall. So those, it, it told us that there's probably fish that we're not detecting here that might be in deeper water or they're being concentrated uh, or they're more vulnerable to the gear. But our catch rates went way up in the fall survey. And uh, there's, you know, some really nice fish that are that are uh, coming out. So this is one. I think this one was uh, almost 12 inches that we, we that we caught in the fall survey, which was pretty exciting. Um, we, we were able to, because these fish are pit tagged, it, it's pretty neat. We're able to monitor their individual growth. So these are uh, the story of growth for two different fish that we caught. And this one we actually caught three times. And uh, it was a, a fish that was part of the fingerling stocking. And then this fish way up here was a fish that we think came from the fry stocking program. And you can see it's significantly lar larger. Um, and its growth rate is was just extraordinary. So um, the fry stock fish, uh, you know, can the river can really grow these things to uh, to be uh, quite extraordinary um, fitness for these individuals. So that that's uh, some new information. There's also some information we're collecting on diet. So we do a a process called gastric lavage. So we we actually uh, put a little tube down the throat of the muscalunge and squirt some water in there and, and it'll regurgitate what it's been eating. Um, and we do a diet analysis. So this is just a, a little bit of summary data on the diet analysis from the fish this year. And, um, you know, we see nitropus species. These are minnows that they're eating. 
uh, 18% uh, banded killifish, which is like a, a top minnow uh, that they're consuming. Um, th these are empty stomachs, so a, a high prevalence of, of nothing in their stomachs. Um, but what's interesting here is 14% of their diet was uh, round goby. So they're, they're eating like early life stages of uh, round goby in, in the system. So that's kind of neat. And I think we even detected a tube nose goby uh, from the stomach of musclonge this year. So that's kind of new information. So does anybody have any questions on any of that? Before I move into our, our culture plan? Not seeing any in the chat. If anybody goes off mute or just wants to chime in. Yeah, John, it's, uh, it's David Heimbach here, uh, Research Director from Muskies Canada. How you doing? Good. Good. Um, hey, um, great, great stuff. I know we've been following along very closely over the last uh, year or so anyways. Um, just want to ask you the question as far as your rearing success. What's, what are some of the secrets to hitting those kind of numbers? Yeah, I, I think the, the secrets were just a lot of hard work. <laughs> um, <laughs> so you're going to hear some updates on our culture plan. It was, uh, you know, th there's something... Uh, kind of funny, not really funny, but we, uh, uh, when we did an egg take, you have to inventory the eggs um, and you, inv you inv we inventoried the eggs. You can do it volumetrically. You can do it gravimetrically by weight. And uh, what we did, we made a, a slight mistake. And we, when we took eggs, um, we apply a, a formula to know like how many eggs there are uh, per unit. And um we, we did that prior to water hardening. So the, the eggs will take on water and become turgid and it takes about an hour for that to happen. So if you inventory your eggs uh, and then apply like an equation that's post water hardened, um, you'll end up with more eggs. And that's that's what we happened, happened to us. So we ended up taking, you know, not a, a crazy number more, but we took more eggs than we normally do. Um, and uh, it led to a, a significant uh, uh, increase in workload, if you will. Um, and I think it ultimately led to us tripling our, our quota um, because we, we really worked hard and uh, maintained good survival. Uh, these fish are fed brine shrimp. Um, so they, they come into the lab. We, you know, hopefully we, we also had really good fertilization success of the eggs. So we, we extract the, uh, milk from the male muskie using syringes and and you got to keep it's called the dry method you got to keep all the water out of it ironically you keep the the eggs just coming out of the female with no water whatsoever and then you uh, mix that uh, milk into the with the syringe you know and distribute it and then you activate the uh, the fertilization process just by saturating those eggs in water and we, we had really good uh fertilization success. Uh, we have a good team. And then uh, those those uh, eggs go into the hatching jars. They the, the ones that weren't fertilized or were damaged will die off. And then we, we did a really nice job of siphoning those off. Um, those, those eggs then hatched out without much mortality at all. And then, uh, you know, we the, the technicians just really kept the tanks clean and removed all the the dead eggs. We we have really nice uh, um, spring water to use at the Tibbs lab to incubate eggs in, in early life stages of these fish. Um, comes right out of the ground and you, it's very pure and it stays at a, a nice uh, constant temperature. And then uh, those those fish swim up and we incubate. We have really nice system for incubating brine shrimp and, and feeding. Uh, so people work, you know, basically from uh, 6 30, 7, usually 6 30 in the morning, uh, till, uh, you know, 9, 10 PM at night, every day of the week for, gosh, it was a hundred days or something. So, uh, and we have teams that rotate through that and had really good, you know, success. Um, but the, the problem with it was, is it, you know, we're researchers and it, it takes an incredible amount of, uh, time. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we, uh, so we're proposing a change. So that's a good segue uh, into our new culture plan. So 
Uh, that's intensive culture. So we, I didn't mention we switched to dry feed and we have automatic dry feeders. And, and that's when, as soon as you start using uh, artificial dry feed and you put it on the fish, disease problems uh, with bacterial gill disease uh, happen like instantly. It's like un, unavoidable. So you have to uh, really keep things clean and, and treat those fish periodically to keep them, to keep that at bay. Um, so we, we did a good job with that as well and got, got good survival. So that's what happened. <laughs> uh, so here's our new culture plan. We just uh, proposed and got some funding from the Fishery Advisory Committee of, of FEMREF. Um, so I just mentioned this rearing process so I can kind of click through this. But what we're, what we're proposing to do this year is we're going to still do the rearing. We'll do the egg take incubation and hatch and rearing at Tibbs, but we're gonna, uh, and then we're gonna do our advanced fry stocking. And then we're actually gonna um, work with uh, the South at Selic fish hatchery down um, in the central New York. Um, and, and they have uh, some brand new ponds. So we have three ponds that are uh, assigned to this project. And there's a great uh, group down there, uh, a fish hatchery manager, we've had, meetings um and we're actually going to be pound pond rearing musculunge this year so we're pretty excited so that the the reason we're doing this is one to you know produce a a, a a hopefully a better product not that the other product was bad but these fish will be grown outside and they're going to be foraging on on live food instead of dry food which i which i think is uh, a real advantage uh for growth and also you know, just selection of uh, traits that 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 fish uh, are actively feeding on their own and preying on minnows. So, you know, we're going to have forage of spawning fathead minnows in these ponds. Uh, they're they're going to be used for walleye production prior to the muskie getting there. So they're going to be really uh, productive and seeded. They'll be draining them for the walleye and then refilling them. So we we feel that the the uh, zooplankton and all the processes that lead to good productivity will be um, there and set uh, for the 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 muscleunge culture period. So there, that's our our new approach. That's going to be this year is to to do pond culture. So we're excited to try that. Those fingerlings are going to go back to Tibbs. They're going to have to be. Uh, we're going to need all the help we can get to get these things tagged and released into the environment. Um, and then uh, they'll be stocked out. So the fry go hopefully before around July 1st, and then the fingerlings will go uh, hopefully in late August, you know, and hopefully no later than like uh, early September. So that's the plan for this year. And we got funding um, and, and new support from New York State DEC at the South at Seela Catchery. So John, we've got a question from uh, Chris Purdy, who's the Ottawa chapter chair, who says, is it fair to say stocking fry versus fingerlings is yielding better results or vice versa? Yeah, that's a really that's a really good question. So, uh, you know, I I am a, a big proponent of fry stocking because I, I think uh, for for uh, improving uh, and restoring musky populations, I'm, I'm a biggest proponent for natural reproduction. And that's where we, our goal is. But yeah, the the fry uh, and and that's part of the study is comparing like the performance of of these uh, life stages for for doing what we're trying to do. Um, we're we're really excited about the fry stocking, and it does increase the uh, catch per unit effort, like you saw in those graphs in our, our nursery locations. Um, but the, the fingerling stocking is going to put a lot more biomass out there. Um, so we'll be, you know, we'll be able to compare, uh, hopefully in the, the adults produced, um, you know, whether or not the, which approach was, uh, uh, drove, uh, the restoration of, uh, spawning and nursery sites. So right now it's kind of like still an ongoing study, but, uh, the fry stocking is, uh, kind of a more natural product and it tells us more about the functioning of the nursery habitat because uh, they're going in there at a very sensitive early life stage versus you know a, a fingerling but these aren't really big fingerlings some programs that have different goals are stocking huge fingerlings uh, and you know it's it's fine to like do that if you want to uh, create you know 
something that might be temporary, but you really need that reproduction in order to, you know, to allow like evolutionary processes and selection to uh, maintain the, the fish population. So I hope that helps. We have a lot more information on it that I presented today. Um, so this is our, our new plan. Um, you know, this is just kind of information. It's about uh, pond rearing and using fathead minnows. So this is an established technique. It's, it, it does have some risk. You know, you have to establish the, the weather really affects fathead minnows. And, um, you know, we're gonna be using uh, five to 15 pounds per acre of those ponds where we, we're gonna be needing some mobile aeration systems to be able to transport the fish. And then we also uh, requested and received uh, funding for 18,000 mini pit tags to, to, for the final three years of the stocking uh, program. John, we have so, another question from Ryan Pickering, who's the president of Muskies Canada. Cost comparison, how many fry can you supply compared to the cost of supplying a fingerling? Yeah, that's that's a really good question. So the, the, the other advantage of fry is that uh, it's really cheap. Um, I, I have to look in my notes to get an exact uh, number, but to, you know, the Artemia is fairly expensive, uh, especially with the conditions that we're seeing, like on Great Salt Lake, where all the uh, Artemia come from. But, you know, so you might spend 80 bucks, uh, just a coffee can size jar of Artemia, but it's it's really quite a a uh, straightforward process. Um, and then once you get into like moving fish and feeding them for periods of months, you know, that's where the, ex and, and fighting diseases and things of that nature, uh, the staff time is a huge part. So, you yeah, know, those fingerlings, I, I've seen numbers of like nine to $15 a fish and stuff like that. I'm sure the prices are going up. Whereas the, you know, to raise uh, a lot of fry um, quickly is, uh, is, is quite uh, less intensive, so much cheaper. Okay, let's see, I'm gonna move on. So we're gonna move on to like an important part of the assessment of the, the Muskie Recovery Program. That's the citizen science program that was created last year. And you can see these characters here that came and visited Tibbs. There were a lot more um, that, uh, that came to a, an event. We had a workshop last year. We'll, we'll probably have another workshop this year. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's there's so many groups that were instrumental to helping support uh, the development of this considerable program that's just getting off the ground. Um, so, you know, there's all these different uh, funding agencies. I apologize if uh, I didn't mention anyone because there's so many people that have contributed the, to this, but uh, we received grants from you know, numerous groups that help uh, support it. We still have some of those funds in our account to, to continue to support it. Um, but uh, you know, we had a, a workshop at the uh, Antique Boat Museum uh, that they didn't charge us anything for. Uh, you know, where we gave backgrounds to muskie management. And we talked to, just like today, we talked about the need for citizen science. And uh, then we went through a lot of procedural stuff about how to collect and report data um, and uh, looking, explaining protocols and data requirements and procedures and, and focusing. We talked, we had discussions about catch and release. Uh, and, you know, I, I wanted to just share some of the 2002 experiences, but I think one of the greatest parts of this workshop is it was like really international. We had participation from both sides and, and, and it was just the, the individual interactions that I think were some of the most powerful uh, parts of the experience. So, and it, it, all, it uh, culminated with that vis visit to Tibbs. So people got to see the muskies in our, our rearing facility. So, um, there, there, basically, there's a, a research kit that was supplied. So a lot of the funding went to the development of these kits uh, that include like a pit tag wand so that the anglers uh, have access to the ability to detect uh, the pit tags that were put in our fingerlings that we hope will be detect detectable in, in the fish they catch when they uh, reach adulthood and enter the fishery. So that's that's really critical information. So they, they're going to be measuring fish and uh, also injecting fish in some cases uh, 
with pit tags where we can get maybe some population estimates. And they're also collecting uh, probably one of the most important things is the just genetic tissue samples. Uh, so they have a sample vial and they take a small uh, piece of fin and, and uh, we get that. So we uh, had uh, 10 kits. We now have 10 kits available to uh, anglers in the U.S. and 10 in Canada. Um, I think we could still use some more uh, really dedicated. We're looking for, you know, angler groups that are really uh, interested in participating and because it does there's there's a considerable effort that goes into this so it's going to interfere um, and change your fishing experience we're hoping that it'll enhance it to participate in the science but um, we kind of had a, a new uh, we we gave it a try this year and we want to uh, continue to develop and improve the program um, so the the objectives were to evaluate this uh, survival and success of the recovery program that I just described, and then get a better understanding of the, the muskie population, like how many, where do they go, growth rates, uh, reproductive homing, and many other questions that we that we need for management to understand uh, this fish and how it's reacting to uh, environmental change and, and angling itself. So that's that's kind of what this thing's all about. Um, we, this is, uh, I don't know if I've updated this, but we have pit tags out in the system and, and Colin's putting pit tags out as well. Um, and fish and wildlife as well. So there's, uh, 125 adults have been pit tagged since 2011 through the spawning surveys. Um, this last year, there were 24 adults, uh, tagged by these organizations, um, and, and so those, those fish are hopefully out there healthy and swimming in the river. Some of these fish from 2011 are probably still around because their longevity can be, you know, upwards over 25 years. So it's, it's uh, very possible some of our biggest fish, you know, so we get really unique, uh, a pit tag gives you a unique identifier so we can look at individual uh, fish and their locations and growth with the pit tags. Um, and then we, we have uh, these fish are now going to be age six. So they're you know getting better than three feet uh, and they're going to be coming in to spawn. So some of the 4,500 fingerlings that were stocked in 2017, we're hoping to see this year. That would be a, an amazing moment. Um, you know, we've got these fish that are going to be age four from 2019, you know, and we're also tagging our, our YOY. Um, that are that are untagged. So in 2020 and 21, there were 75 YOY tag that are that are getting older. So we continue to tag uh, YOY as well. So anglers may catch those as they enter the fishery. Um, so uh, this is older information because we have we have uh, 6,000 fish that were tagged this year that can be added to this. So you know it's up, it's up getting closer to 12,000 fish a tag. Um, and future tagging will include anglers putting tags in. So there were, I think, five tags applied in the program this year, um, mostly on the Canadian side. So, you know, we're going to see if that'll continue to expand. Um, and then uh, we're going to continue to uh, be putting pit tags in the fish. Uh, so, you know, there was a decision tree uh, in the training of uh, when you wand the fish was the first thing to do. And then, you know, if it had a, a tag, we record a photo of the identifier and the, the proportions of the fish and report it. Um, there was a uh, Chad Lapa developed a nice reporting system. That's kind of a modification of the chapter 69 uh, angler di electronic angler diary submission system to the St. Lawrence project. Um, so, you know, it's, it's really quite slick. Um, and then if a pit tag wasn't detected, uh, this is the information. So we had a training about how to do all this stuff. Um, we noticed that this year, the, a lot of the anglers, uh, were new to it. Um, they were out, uh, in kind of difficult conditions. Uh, we, we had warm water early, so we kind of postponed the, the, uh, project till September 1st. We think we're going to do that again this year. So we're going to really focus on the fall fishery um to protect the muskies and then uh yeah so we'll hopefully you know we we also had a uh kind of follow-up uh survey and got some feedback i haven't summarized that for day for today 
I apologize, but uh, you know, we did get a lot of verbal feedback and, you know, I think people want more training to be more comfortable. There's, it's difficult to be uh, out there and on your own and, and to do all this data collection. So, you know, we're, we're going to kind of do this again with the workshop and get more feedback to try to optimize it more. But one thing that was really clear is everybody was really excited about the program and uh, wanted, wanted to uh, be part of it and continue to be part of it. So we don't, we, we feel like we have really good uh, camaraderie in terms of like making this work and uh, we're going to continue to try to support it and grow it. Um, you know, measuring the fish. This is some of the stuff that was going on and people normally do that anyhow. And then, you know, wanding the fish. Uh, there's a 15 digit tag number, taking a photo of it, uh, you know, getting the location of the catch, uh, releasing the fish unharmed. Um, maybe not every fish should be tagged. So, you know, there's kind of an assessment of whether uh, that fish is going to be okay. So we don't want to, you know, add additional stress to it. Um, you know, genetic sample, really important, just taking it from the, the uh, corner of the caudal fin, uh, just a little tiny piece of one centimeter squared, about the size of a dime or less into the vial for our genetics work. Um, we take a scale sample. It's probably one of the less important things, but it's a backup genetic sampling tool. It, it, it can be used for aging for young muscolines, but it's not a very reliable aging technique. Um, and then filling out a, a fish scale envelope, um, probably not with a typewriter, like uh, with this electronic, but uh, handwritten. Um, and then, you know, inserting a, a tag into the fish. Uh, which is one of the most challenging parts. But once you uh, tag about 6,000 fingerlings, you get a good knack for this. But this is something that I think the anglers need uh, to become comfortable with. We don't require that people do this, but uh, um, that's uh, part of the project. John, um, we, have, uh, we have a question if you've got a sure. moment. Sure, yep. Yeah, so I have a question. How, how expensive are the pit tag kits? Yeah, and you know, I want to thank like Rob McRae and uh, all these musky groups, uh, Trevor and others that contributed funds and the grants. But they're they were uh, I think about uh, eight hundred bucks a piece. So yeah, just in kits alone, I think that was like over eight or nine thousand dollars. So it's a significant significant investment, and they're very professional. Uh, kits and you know we're hoping that people can keep them in their boat and it'll just become part of their musky fishing lifestyle um but yeah if they're you know i can understand if people you know if it interferes with their fishing experience that they might not want to participate so we're kind of focusing on people that you know really want to uh contribute uh and and and, and enjoy that kind of part because it is extra handling and it does it would take time away from you know, the angling and might change the angling experience a little bit. Uh, we hope to minimize that. So let's see. So yeah, I mentioned the release and reporting. So there's, uh, we have we have uh, another program, which is also very important. You saw the data and that's our angler diary program. So that's another for people that might not want to do the more intensive uh, focus, they could join the uh, and, and do the Angler Diary program. And, and we thank Chad Lappa um, from, he, he's just a computer guy. So he put together a beautiful uh, online system. Some people prefer the original books. So we provide those. Um, and uh, that's that's been going on since 1999 and really important to track the fishery. So that's... Uh, uh, we also got into catch and release. Um, you know, release a muskie is so important. Here's a here's a release, which is kind of cool. You can see that muskie swimming off, and that one looks really happy, doesn't it? It's just you know getting away and uh, looks really healthy. So that's what we kind of want to promote. And uh, you know, release is proven. I think you guys know that. We we actually did studies on it and saw increased mean size and reproduction increases following catch and release ad uh, adoption. Save the River started a, a wonderful program in 1987. And then, you know, there's other studies about 
Declining Annual Mortality, John Castleman's work, um, and then uh, Sean Landsman and Hessenauer's uh, more recent studies, uh, you know, looking at mortality for catch and release musclonge and, and finding it uh, quite low um, using specialized rec recreational fishing gear so that musky anglers tend to do well with this. Uh, there's a recent study, um, my former PhD student, um, uh, Derek Crane, his his graduate student, and this is a southern river, but they looked at uh, catch and release and showed low catch rates and high mortality during high water temperatures. Um, so th this was a, a big warning sign that, you know, when you're fishing in those summer uh, hot days that, you know, it's it's kind of a, a different set of circumstances. Those Those fish, when they're thermally stressed, you know, it puts additional strain on them. Um, you know, I could get into what I teach about in ichthyology with like uh, red and white muscle and, you know, how, how these fish are, uh, they really uh, are sit and wait predators. So they, they burn their energy up and then they're kind of spent, right? And it's at that time that they need to recover and high water temperatures can really inhibit uh, uh, the release success. So that's one of the reasons why we're postponing. We're really going to focus on the fall because this added... Uh, stress um on the fish uh is something we you know obviously the goal is not to, to harm the fish we want them to release well um even after all that data collection so that's something that that's an adjustment that we're making uh to protect them um so uh tips for we went over some tips for you know we can always improve you guys do a really good job with this but uh you know we talked about how to best release muscles to limit their stress um, and then, uh, you know, just some thoughts on all that is, you know, we think natural reproduction is really what's about sustainability in the river. Um, there's lots of, uh, management partners in place and, you know, we've got a great group, uh, you know, this is a long-term study, uh, to guide and evaluate, uh, the success of, of the recovery program and the, the population it's adaptive. We'll continue to change with research. That's what research is all about. We, we got a lot of work going on with these uh, uncertainties. So there's there's things that need to be understood about invasive species. I mentioned water soldier today, and then we're, we're still dealing with VHS uh, in the environment. Um, you know, so habitat protection, re restoration, and, and sound management are just key principles to help us with musky conservation and sustainability. Uh, collaborations, commitment, and funding help make that happen. And uh, you guys are a big, obviously a, a huge part of this whole process. And, you know, thanks for the invitation. And uh, that's, uh, I think that's uh, most of my time and I, I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks, John. We've got a, a couple of questions for you that have come in over the last few minutes in the chat. So uh, one from Matt Lee. Um, after the final three years, what'll go into determining whether the stocking program continues? Yeah, I we're gonna we'll revisit it. Um, you know, I'm not saying it it won't continue. It, it, I think we're we're gonna take a breather and revisit all the data. We'll probably have a really big uh, you know workshop meeting. We'll look at the science. We'll talk to our uh, funding agencies. It happens to coincide with like uh, our funding cycle uh, through the uh, Environmental Protection Fund uh, through DEC. New York to state DEC. And, uh, you know, if we start seeing really positive uh, indicators of, of uh, building the population back, um, you know, maybe we, we would uh, take a pause. Um, but if, you know, if we, if, and if we see, uh, you know, kind of uh, improvement in the population, but we're not quite there, then there, there'll probably be discussion to continue with some element. We'll look at the science of you know, the fry versus fingerlings and the effects on the genetics. I, I didn't really, because we use so much time, I didn't really get, you know, to the second part of my presentation, which was, you know, we're going to be um, going into a, a, a study where we're looking at the movements. So, you know, maybe at a future meeting, I could, uh, we have, we have a big collaboration coming up. Um, we're putting out 34 acoustic tags uh, working with uh, DEC, um, Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources, and uh, uh, Colin might mention this because he's a big part of the 
the project, uh, Scott Schluter and Fish and Wildlife Service, and then uh, Daniel Hatton uh, down in uh, Quebec uh, below the dam. So we're gonna be looking at um, putting fish uh, with tags uh, into the acoustic array from Eastern Lake Ontario all the way to um, Lake St. Francis. So really exciting partnership. I probably should have focused on that, but we just got funding to do it. And the other exciting thing about it uh, that I just want to mention quick is there's a geneticist, uh, Dr. Nick Sard from uh, Oswego State University, who is just an incredible uh, evolutionary biologist and conservation geneticist. He worked on salmon in the, in the Pacific Northwest, and he does this thing called uh, sibship. So he looks at sibling uh, relationships. It's a perfect application to understanding how young of the year muscalange relate to the adult stock. Um, and, you know, we're just uh, going to give them this huge genetic archive. And, you know, I'm the ecologist. I'll work with the geneticist and we'll try to help inform uh, management with some really new information on genetics and, and movements uh, in, in the muskie population. So I think we'll just have to save that. Um, but uh, here's another question. What are some visible signs of BHSV in muskies? Good, really good question. So muskies can develop, um, you know, the disease is uh, hemorrhagic. It's a hemorrhagic disease. So they, you can get eye bulging. Um, you can get uh, visible uh, hemorrhages on the fins. So the fins can look uh, like really bloodied. Um, you know, the, fit, the fish might be lethargic. Um, but, you know, typically uh, when a, a muscalange has like uh, an active like viral infection, you know, it's probably not going to recover from it. Um, but, uh, you know, we have fish that carry the virus, too. So, you know, whether or not they all die is unknown. Um, so, you know, they, they'll, they'll show signs of uh, hemorrhaging, uh, you know, from the internal organs. Um, and uh, sometimes you'll see pale gills. So if if that uh, blood is like accumulating from hemorrhaging in the body cavity, it's not in the gills. So the gill might be very pale. Um, we do have some, some archives of images uh, of fish that uh, are suffering from it. So that's a really good question. And we, yeah, again, we want to know what you guys are seeing on the water. Um John, there's a question a little bit earlier. Does your diary program support uh, Muskie's Canada diary results? Yeah, I mean, we've talked about that. And we, we'd we love to, uh, you know, look at that information uh, and compare it to ours. Um, you know, and I, I you know, I encourage uh, uh, people to use the diary program that are fishing on the St. Lawrence, but I know there's the lunge log um, as well. And, uh, you know, we uh, probably want to, I don't know if, if people should choose like one or the other, because if you contribute to both, it might kind of bias the uh, the effort and the result. John, can I step in here? So Rob McCray. Hi, Rob. We have we have been uh, looking at uh, collecting or collating our data from the Upper St. Lawrence in through Lake St. France into Lake St. Francis and through uh, Lake St. Lawrence, uh, collating that data, and I mean even including upwards of the St. Lawrence River in Montreal, just to make sure you have a single document that shows uh, the catch rates. Uh, I've spoken to uh, Pierre, who is our uh, our kind of our guru, and of course uh, Davin Heinbuck, which you spoke to earlier. He's kind of the father of our program here. Uh, I'll speak with them specifically on the reporting and give you a single page or a page and a half of the data that you would require that you would consider useful for it. And from there, you could tell us if you want more of it or what you receive is good enough. Davin has just posted a content a, a comment on the uh, on the chat as well. Uh, saying uh, that we would be happy to share with you. And our, one way ours varies from lunge log is that we log effort. Great. That Yeah, I would love to see that and, and compare it to our index. And um, yep, fantastic.
and it, it's great that you guys do effort because it's you know much more valuable when you can have uh, a, a catch per effort. It's a question from Davin. Sorry, no, no, no question. I was just making uh, just a comment there in the in the chat that uh, that that data is available, John, and we can discuss later too um, what you might be looking for. Um, but yeah, the one thing that we do have is we have a lot of uh, log diary records, and it's all based on catch per unit effort. So, um, but fantastic. Yeah, I'd love to. I'd love to see that. I haven't seen it, and I think I've seen versions of it in the past, but it's been a while, and I, you know, could be very valuable information yeah asking you shall receive thank you no problem well john you as a um hall of fame member you'll get a lifetime membership and we have some really interesting analytic tools that have been developed to go along with the muskies canada uh data information so there's some uh, some really good functionality to be able to look at and analyze the data right within the Muskies Canada tool set. So uh, you'll be able to log into that and and uh, you know be able to, to to take advantage of that. So um, great opportunity to be able to share again our citizen science that we've been developing for a long time to be able for for you to be able to analyze that as well. And uh, you know it provides a little bit of different information than the lunge log program, but uh, it's all useful body of knowledge to be able to work with. So thanks, Davin, and, and, and thanks, John, for that. Yeah, that's that's exciting. I think we'd really benefit from uh, access to that and continued collaboration. So look forward to that. Sounds good. Any other questions for uh, Dr. Farrell while we uh, get ready? Matt, you'll be up in a moment or two if you're uh, if you're just about ready to go. Uh, but in the oh yeah, we got uh, a, a question from uh, Andrej. Yes, uh, with with those pit kits, how how complicated or how intense is the training for the angler to to use it properly out on the water? For the 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 wand part and the, yes. the kit in general, the whole kit. Yeah, I, it, you might want to talk to some of the people starting in the program, but we, we try to minimize the impact on the fishing experience. Um, and, uh, you, you know, it's, uh, I think one of the biggest issues is, is fish, the holding the fish that we're running into. So the, you know, whether people are using a cradle or if they have, ideally people have like a large enough uh, live well, which is kind of rare to hold a muskellunge um, on their boat. So, um, you know, I think people are su most successfully just um, having a, a long handled net and doing the, keeping the fish in the water the whole time. So, it, and so it's a lot of like tough on the back kind of work. Um, and, uh, you know, we want to minimize holding. So I, I don't think it's, you know, people who musky fish tend to have a lot of experience holding and working with them. And, uh, you know, it, it goes, it looks like a long list of things, but when you're efficient and you lay everything out, like prior to, uh, to the process, you can kind of bang through it pretty quickly. And that, you know, we have a lot of experience from our spring spawning work, uh, but we put the fish in a big tank. Um, you know, people are hanging over the gunnel, working in a net, and depending on the weather conditions, it, it can be challenging. Um, well, well but, what would the time frame be? The time frame, yeah, I, I think you could do the entire process in less than. You know, I think if you got really good, three to five minutes. Okay, thank you. Other questions for Dr. Farrell? If not, just John, we would really like to thank you for uh, for all that you do and for all that Tibbs does to contribute to musky science. It's so important for, for Muskies Inc. and Muskies Canada to be able to partner with you and share information back and forth and to, uh, to really have a uh, you know, a, a great working relationship and good collaboration with the, you know, with the anglers that care so much about the resource. So thank you very much for that.
Um, Matt Wendell, if you're ready to go, I'll uh, I'll introduce you. Uh, Matt is our next speaker, and Matt Wendell is the program leader uh, for research and technical services uh, for the uh, the, uh, the River Institute uh, in Cornwall. And uh, you know, Matt is, uh, works uh, has been working for a number of years on the fish identification nearshore survey. And one of the things that this survey has been able to do uh, through, again, through collaboration is to, is to start to uh, have a look into um, the overall population of all species, but to keep an eye on musky young of the year on the Canadian side as well. That contributes to our sense of how are things going and what the, what the issues are. So Matt, thank you uh, uh, and welcome over to you. Thank you, Peter. Can you see the uh, the slide deck? Okay, I just want to confirm that. Yep, it's up. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, great. Yeah, no. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, speak to everybody today, and uh, you know, just uh, listening to all all of John's research there. Uh, you know, um, it's really inspiring, actually. So this is a much smaller, uh, reduced scale version of of all the work that uh, John's doing, but. Um, you know, a lot of it actually is, is very inspired by. We've learned a lot from, from John as well. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll, I'll highlight some of that uh, coming up in the talk. So yeah, uh, today, it's just, uh, it's just a great opportunity to share our ongoing research in the, the Canadian waters of the St. Lawrence River and um, how that relates to tracking uh, recruitment and, and muscalunge populations in the river. And that, that first photo there is just a really nice one. That's uh, a new muscalunge site that we found in 2022. Uh, it's on Cornwall Island. So we have a lot of uh, Aquasasne uh, staff as well as River and Sioux staff sampling that site there. I'll, I'll just start by uh, talking about the River Institute really quickly. Uh, the River Institute, it, we're a nonprofit research organization uh, founded in 1994 and uh, largely founded to address um, area of concern issues around Cornwall and the St. Lawrence River um, that had to do with contaminants being released from industrial activities over, over a century. So a lot of mercury and uh, PCBs and other uh, pollutants were released into the river and affected the ecosystem. And there's a lot of community questions and a lot of uh, desire for uh, um, a local source of information and research that could address those. So that's that, that was, the reason that the Institute was founded. And since 1994, it's expanded to look at other ecological issues and research in the St. Lawrence River. And the mandate also includes um, education and outreach. So there's a huge component of what we do is translating science to the public and people will come to us with questions and we'll, we'll provide uh, science talks, publicly available science talks and try to, try to communicate sort of more complex um, research and findings into uh, easily understood or um, concepts that could really be uh, matched really well with uh, community questions. And we, uh, the River Institute's a fairly small organization. Uh, we have a little over 30 staff, but that does include uh, a lot of research with PhDs, master's degrees, and uh, a lot of experience with education. So the River Institute, just to um, reiterate, is located in Cornwall, Ontario. So from 1994, I started at the River Institute in 2013, and in 2015, a couple of years after I started, I uh, was talking with this fellow here, uh, Henry Lickers, many of you might know him uh, from the Mohawk Council of Aquasasne. Henry's now um, part of the IJC board. He, uh, you know, we were just in talks with Henry and there was a lot of community questions about what the state of freshwater or small fish populations and the St. Lawrence River, a lot of focus is on the uh, large adult sport fish in the area and there, there's great index um, programs tracking that but there wasn't a lot of knowledge or information or background information on small fish populations and some of the local community members you know they put out their trap nets their little uh, minnow nets and they weren't catching as much or they were noting some shifts and what, what they were catching so that's how this project really started is it's this great uh, partnership between the river institute and the mohawk council of aquasasne's environment program staff and we came up with this name for the project Fish Identification Near Shore Survey, or FINS for short. So you'll hear me refer to it as FINS from now on. And it's, you know, 
started in 2015. We're eight years on now, and it's uh, it's been a great project. So we've really learned and expanded a lot in terms of what we're covering uh, geographically and also um, the types of research questions that we're addressing through the project. And it's resulted in really great capacity building for not only the River Institute, but the, uh, the Mohawk Council of Aquasosceny's environment program as well. So bringing in new technologies, having people trained up on on different field methods has been great. Uh, we've made all kinds of great partnerships all up and down the river with other organizations and agencies uh, doing similar research or interested in the same type of research. You can see some, the top uh, photo there, that's um, some Queen's University students with our uh, crew out sampling and, and they're uh, helping us do some genetic and, and eDNA um, research with the sampling that we're doing. Um, and then the center photo there, you can see a lot of staff from Aquasosceny's environment program out with our team uh, sampling around uh, Aquasosceny. We have a lot of sampling effort in the area. Um, it's uh, historically very data deficient, so we're filling in a lot of new data gaps there. And then the bottom there, uh, one of our uh, uh, technicians are holding some um, fish at that muscalunch site I was showing at the beginning. I'll just go over quickly what the, the FINS project involves. Um, so one of the main, as I mentioned, one of the main focuses and objectives is to document near shore fish populations. And this is really translated into tracking a lot of species at risk as well, um, in particular pugno shiner, but also bridal shiner, cuddle minnow uh, throughout, throughout the river as well. So we've received quite a bit of funding from um, government agencies to do that type of species at risk focus. But while you're out there doing that, you can also focus on other species um, and um, Young of the Year Muscalunch has been a really nice bonus species that we can study through this type of funding. The, uh, you saw through John's um, talk there, uh, the seining um, technique. So that's what we use. We have uh, beach seines and uh, that type, this is a 30 foot net. Um, but right at the beginning of the project, we had the opportunity to go visit John at Tibbs and, and learn about their sampling methods. and. This 30 foot net is modeled after the, the net that we saw them using at the time. So I really appreciate that uh, help with that kind of coming up with the, the methodology. Now we also have a 60 foot net as well, but we tend to use the 30 foot net for most of our sites. Um, and at each one of our sites, we also do a standardized aquatic vegetation survey. So aquatic vegetation is really important for structuring um, fish communities that you see, and uh, also helps track some new invasive species. Um, as well. So we haven't seen water soldier yet, but uh, we, we do see quite a bit of invasive uh, Eurasian milfoil at a lot of our sites. And uh, there seems to be some impacts on fish communities when you, you find uh, really dense stands of that. All of our sites do, we're looking at water quality. So that could be as simple as water clarity, but we're also taking samples to look at uh, nutrient levels. So phosphorus and uh, nitrates, for example, which drive algal blooms and uh, potentially affect oxygen levels in really shallow warm waters of the river. Um, we're also noting what types of substrates are out there, uh, shoreline characteristics as well, um, natural versus developed is really nice to communicate if, if you do find really nice uh, muscalunge nursery sites, whether or not they're, they have natural shorelines, for example. Um, so much of the upper St. Lawrence River is developed shoreline, uh, privately owned with hardened shorelines or modified shorelines. and um, so there's quite a bit of impact to habitat immediately close to the shorelines where some nurseries might uh, occur. So it's, it's uh, an important factor to track as well. Uh, several years ago, we started using drones uh, as part of our surveys as well. So we'll put a drone up in the air and we'll get really high resolution aerial uh, imagery of our site. And we take hundreds of photos, sometimes thousands of a site, and we stitch those all together into a single map. and. Uh, that's a really nice record of what the site looked like on that day. And you can revisit that map afterwards, that imagery, and, and have a really close look at uh, habitat characteristics, distribution of uh, aquatic vegetation, for example, um, is really important. And we're, we're now getting into analyzing that imagery and trying to tease out if we can uh, tell certain types, groups of species of plants, for example, um, that'll really just help us improve our aquatic vegetation survey coverage. So really neat things are, we're doing with the drones and um, you know the, the, uh, the uh, simplest thing it can do is just give you a really quick, nice high resolution uh, image of your site. 
And um, you can tr use that to track changes over time as well. So it could be flood years, could be developing shorelines from property development, things like that um, over time. We also recently have uh, started collecting environmental DNA or eDNA samples at all of our sites. Uh, we started this in earnest back in 2020 and it's, uh, it's going really well now. And this is just another uh, new tool and you heard John mention that as well. It's a great tool to supplement with uh, conventional methods of catching fish where you can uh, potentially um, scoop up and amplify free floating DNA in the water column and then uh, look at that DNA, sequence it, and um, target species uh, within that amplified DNA sample. Um, potentially muscalinge could be found this way as well. Our project, it's, it's eight years on now, so we're, we're developing uh, long-term monitoring sites and uh, nowhere near the scale that John has or other programs in the, the Thousand Islands, but we're, you know, you have to start somewhere. So we're we're, uh, some of our sites now we have eight years of data and uh, we're, we're doing our best to put together funding and, and collaborations to keep that going uh, well into the future. And in particular, a lot of the uh, focal sites of our long-term monitoring are uh, these muscalunge nursery sites. This project is really great too, at just informing of lots of other community questions and issues and other initiatives. Uh, we have a really large program, another project that another uh, colleague of mine leads at the River Institute called the River Rapport. That's um, putting together um, um, essentially summaries of ecosystem indicators that the community has identified. And, and several of those are uh, fish indicators. Uh, others can be related to bird or water quality, um, contaminants, things like that. So the, the data from the FINS project feeds into this larger ecosystem indicator project. Um, and we also are able to use our data set to answer questions from the public. For example, um, the impacts, ecological impacts of fluctuating water levels, which we've seen, uh, I have a couple of figures, uh, photos coming up to show you, um, pretty drastic impacts of that. Um, and the, there is some community concerns that, you know, so when we go to a site and we're, we uh, sample fish communities, um, we're able to note if there's any changes year to year um, because of those water level conditions, for example. This project's been fantastic to work collaboratively with other organizations. And uh, you can see uh, some people squinting into a fish viewer there. Uh, one pointing, there's uh, Stafford and Bojan from Queen's University. So they're uh, very much lab-based biologists, uh, or they were at the start of this. So they very good in molecular methods, but um, the fish species, they, they couldn't actually identify a fish um, that they were identifying through molecular methods. So it's been a great partnership to bring them out into the field. Um, we, we essentially do the fish collections and, and provide tissue samples and environmental DNA samples to, um, to collaborators like uh, Stafford and Bojan, who then take that um, information and, and run with it essentially in the lab and um, provide some other um, perspectives on, on what was going on at the site. The project's also been really fantastic for providing these unique high-level training opportunities, in particular for young professionals. It's there's not a lot of opportunities like this. Um, you, you really have to go to university graduate uh, level education to receive that. Um, but once you get going in the job market, uh, you might might uh, find a little bit of um, uh, slum pickings essentially for some of these opportunities. So it's been a really nice thing to see and, and help uh, a lot of young professionals grow in their careers. Um, we've had over 60 People pass through the project at various stages and uh, receive this kind of high-level training. And we've it's been really nice to see them go on and, and use these skills to acquire jobs and um, continue research in other areas. So I'll move into, that's a little summary of uh, the project's methodologies. So I'll, um, I'll move in now into some of our survey efforts uh, in 2022 last year. So that would have been our eighth year of the project. And we had, uh, um, 30 crew and volunteer total. So it's, it's a big effort to a lot of uh, people. When you consider that the River Institute is only 30 people, um, you know, to have this many people on a single project uh, has been great. And our, um, our focus, uh, we have a lot of focus in Aquasosne. So there's a lot of sampling at sites there and we're trying to develop long-term sites, help the environment program there, track changes over time. And we've also expanded into other First Nations uh, territories, so Ganawage and uh, Lac Saint Louis, 
Uh, it's been a great partnership uh, where we've been sampling with them for the last two years. And last year, we also went into Tidenega um, down in the uh, Bay of Quinte area, and we're sampling sites there as well. So really expanding the geographic scope and partnerships with Indigenous um, organizations has been great. The, uh, another great collaboration we have had, uh, um, the first one we did with uh, the Thousand Islands National Park staff, and you can see uh, probably a lot of you recognize uh, Josh, super tall Josh there standing out of the water in the top image there. And uh, Rob McCray is out in the, the photo there as well. Um, so we were out sampling with them this summer in August. And that, uh, that was a follow-up to six years ago. We actually went uh, sampling them with, with them for the first time. And so it was a nice uh, return to that. And it was a great day. We, we did find, we didn't find any muskellunge wildlife that day, but we did find uh, quite a few Northern Pike juveniles. So um, really nice to continue with that collaboration and, and share data and coordinate sampling uh, in the Thousand Islands in particular. Another really neat, a uh, collaborator that showed up last year it was, uh, I don't know if any of you've ever met uh, Erling Holm from the Royal Ontario Museum's uh, fish identification workshops. Erling's been running those for decades and quite a few of our staff have been through those just to help uh, boost our fish ID skill sets over the years. Um, they're just uh, kind of world-class workshops. So to have Erling join us uh, last year was really special and then actually see all the training he helped uh, you know, translate to actual project results and jobs. So um, that was really special. And that was in August last year. And I, I think we've uh, hooked him. So he wants to come back uh, again this in 2023. This map here, you can see, uh, this shows the distribution of our sampling efforts in the upper St. Lawrence River. And uh, a lot going on in terms of points here. Um, hopefully that's coming across on your screens. Um, all the green dots, all the green points represent uh, survey sites over the years from 2015 to 2022. And the, the red dots are ones that we sampled in 2022. So a lot of those are repeat sites. Um, most of them actually in 2022 were repeat sites. Um, and you can see that, you know, over the years, we kind of alternate and we have, uh, as John mentioned, sometimes you have uh, sentinel sites and sometimes uh, or index sites. And then we also have uh, quite a few roving sites that um, we might sample for other project objectives, such as looking for other species at risk, for example. So the, the majority of the sampling for this project uh, last year happened in July and August, and, and mostly in August. And uh, we, we actually didn't do a lot of sampling in the Quebec waters. Uh, so it's Lake St. Francis and downstream into Lake Lac St. Louis last year because uh, the the uh, MFFP, the ministry in, in Quebec, did a uh, large scale uh, near shore sailing program last year. Um, they do one about every five years or so. So that, that geographic area is being covered by them already. So we, we, we focused on other areas last year. Overall, this is just some uh, kind of stats from the last eight years. We, we have over 230 sites in the river, um, 600 surveys. Each survey is a, a minimum of three hauls. So that's um, uh, a lot of effort there. I, I think we'll probably get over 200,000 fish this year when we keep going, but uh, lots of species. We have you know, over 100 eDNA and drone survey, there's a little typo there, uh, drone survey sites as well. And then uh, thousands of habitat measurements associated with all these sites. Last year, we did environmental DNA sampling at, at all of our sites. So 50 sites roughly there, and you can see in, in the bottom uh, photo there, actually, I'll, I'll, yeah, you can see, I'll just back up here. You can see this filter that's being shown here. So water's passed um, through sterilized tubing into this fi filter holder here, and it's pushed against this really fine uh, mesh filter. It's actually only one micron. So it essentially looks like a piece of plastic. And any bits of DNA that are floating in the water actually get stuck to that filter. And then it's carefully folded, as you can see here, and placed in a buffer. And then we uh, put that in a uh, in a cold storage and freezers, and that can be maintained uh, for PCR application for for years, essentially. Um, so we 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 sample eDNA at all of our sites, and and the way that works is you take a water bottle sterilized, you you do several uh, collect one liter samples throughout the site. Um, those are a little bit subsurface. So it's interesting that this is kind of a, 
emerging area in terms of what the best sampling protocol is. Um, so we're, we're working on that as well. And I'm interested to talk to John about some of their successes with um, sampling methods with eDNA. But you can see in the bottom picture here, uh, there's Lizzie doing, um, we, we filter all the sites on, uh, the samples on site. So that easy flow uh, peristalt pump you can see set up there pushes water through this filter and then we, we preserve it um, immediately on site. So there's no deterioration of the DNA sample. And on the top photo there, you can see Emma, who was uh, part of uh, a week-long journey on the Lampsilis vessel, which uh, began Lake Ontario and went all the way to the um, uh, Gulf of St. Lawrence. And she, she essentially went to the end, end of the uh, upper St. Lawrence River. But that was a great opportunity to collect uh, eDNA samples um, in the center channel of the river, because typically we're collecting in the near shore areas. So it was a great opportunity to compare um, offshore versus nearshore fish signals. And uh, that might help us interpret a little bit what we're seeing in the nearshore areas. So we, we did a quite a, we've done a lot of training of our staff to be able to do this uh, environmental DNA sampling, um, as well as processing the samples and then sequencing them. So there's been a lot of effort uh, there with workshops. And um, we've also um, done a lot of work to acquire primers and probes that are essentially uh, unique signatures for species that we can uh, match up with our samples and, and see what uh, shows up. So a lot of this uh, eDNA work has been a great collaboration with uh, Dr. Stephen Lougheed's lab at Queen's University and his uh, grad students. And you can see uh, Stafford there showing some of our staff um, how to do some of the qPCR uh, amplification, I believe there, they're doing that. Um, and Dr. Oriane uh, Tournier from France also has been a great help uh, with that regard. And Stafford and Oriane, um, as part of Stafford's PhD, he actually took all of our 2021 eDNA samples and ran metabarcoding. So it's essentially, essentially, you isolate the fish signal of the DNA lump that was filtered out of the water column, and then you, you sequence all of it, and you see how many species of fish show up in that. And you need really powerful supercomputers to do this. And it takes a little bit of time and quite an expensive uh, equipment that we don't have at the River Institute. So this is a great um, example of this, what happens when you partner up with people and we provide the samples in it and then they do the, uh, the lab component. And this is a really interesting, uh, so this figure here, this is the meta barcoding results. And it, there's a lot of blue dots here. So the way to interpret this is that every single one of those blue dots is a hit for a species at a site. And on the left, you can see the hits for eDNA. And on the right, at the exact same sites, you can see what fish were actually captured through conventional saning methods. And a lot more showing up in eDNA, essentially, is a take-home message here, um, particularly for some species that are very rarely caught in the saning. Uh, for example, common carp, um, very sensitive vibrations in the water. They, they scatter pretty quickly. But eDNA picks them up at almost all of our sites. So they're there. We're just not catching them. So it's a great example of how eDNA can show presence absence at sites. There are some limitations with this and uh, interpretations as well. Um, you know, we're not quite sure the, uh, the um, residency time of the eDNA in the water column. It is a large river system, so there's a lot of flowing water. So there's some interpretation needed on, on whether a signal originates upstream or, or locally. Um, but it's still, it's, it's really interesting to see these uh, presence absence results for so many species. And we end up finding quite a bit, few more species through eDNA screening, um, as well as species at risk. But we want to talk about wildlife muscalinge. And um, essentially, the screening from the 2021 sampling for metabarcoding, we only found three sites out of the uh, over 50 sites we, we submitted for the, the analyses. Um, only three had it's for muscalunge. Um, and the interesting thing is uh, in 2021, we only found one young of the year muscalunge in our, all of our surveys. And eDNA did not correspond, the hit for eDNA did not correspond to the site where we actually caught the young of the year muscalunge. Um, so there's a little bit of a mismatch there. And then if you look at where the three sites were actually were, only one of those are known as historical muscalunge nursery sites. So this is where we're getting into a little bit of interpretation fun with some of these results. Um, I'm hoping that our qPCR analysis of our eDNA samples from 2021 and 2022 will be um, a little more 
revealing than what uh, the Metabaric coding result, uh, results showed. Um, on that front, we made a, the River Institute made a really exciting purchase last year uh, through some great uh, uh, donations from uh, several organizations. Um, so we, we now have a qPCR unit, and we're doing lots of training actually coming up later this month on, uh, on uh, lab procedures and protocols and how to use that. We've been collaborating for you know several years with Queen's University and essentially outsourcing our, our uh, lab analyses to them. Um, so this is a really nice new exciting phase where we can do all this analysis or a lot of it uh, in-house at the River Institute now, which is great. Switching to drones, uh, we do drone uh, surveys at all of our sites as well, and they, they yield these really nice results. So this is uh, one of our sites where we actually caught three young of the year Muscalenge last year. And if you look carefully through the, the image, this, this map actually is um, made up of many different images that are blended together, stitched together in software. But if you look at the slightly offshore, you can see the trail actually where the seining crew walked through that uh, vegetation patch um, and scooped up the uh, fish in the seines in three halls. And then you can see, um, essentially you can, you can match up where the fish was caught with the exact um, locations in this imagery because we GPS waypoint everything as well on the ground. So uh, this is just a really powerful tool to show the distribution of aquatic beds, uh, macrophyte beds, vegetation beds in relation to where we're catching the fish. And one of the neat things we're working on right now is taking that imagery and actually trying to classify objects in that imagery, and in this case, uh, types of vegetation. And we use the uh, standardized uh, vegetation quadrat surveys we're doing, where we just put a one meter square um, quadrat in the water and along transects, we, we count up the proportion of all the species that fall within that. So we're ground truthing theories of it. And we can actually then um, tell the, uh, the software, the, the GIS software we're doing, we're using, um, this particular square of this image corresponds to this species classify the rest of the image based on that information. And you get things like this, where all the yellow parts of that image there are, correspond to yellow pond lily and uh, the green areas. Um, it's being interpreted as being this uh, charo species, which is a um, ground cover essentially underwater uh, algae that's uh, very prolific and important fish habitat. So this is a really neat thing we're, we're working on. Um, there's a lot of trial and error, uh, things like shadows and wave action can really impact the uh, classification accuracy of the imagery, but um, it has a lot of applications for other habitat features as well. So woody debris, um, bottom substrates, uh, sizes as well. So we can classify rock sizes out of this as well. And getting into the, uh, the results from last year. So we caught uh, in that 50, 50 sites uh, throughout the year, mostly in July and August, um, extending all the way from Bay of Quinte all the way down to Lac St. Louis. We, we caught uh, 40 species. Um, and most of that's from nine species. And this is pretty typical every year. It's, it's really dominated by nine or 10 species. Then you have a handful of uh, fairly rare species mixed in there. So I've listed uh, here, um, anyone that's done seining in the St. Lawrence River would recognize all these as pretty typical abundant near shore species. Unfortunately, the uh, the round goby on the bottom right there is one of the, uh, the more uh, abundant species in the survey. We also note uh, species at risk. Last year we documented uh, three. Um, Pugno shiner has been a focus of our project. The great thing about Pugno shiner is that they tend to prefer very similar habitat conditions to young of the year uh, muscalinge nursery sites. So there's a nice overlap there um, where we, we tend to find them at the same sites. Um, you can see a bottom right picture there. That's the uh, cutlet minnow, the, uh, the little fish that picks the eyes out of a uh, larger fish. If you ever <laughs> find those, uh, you, might be, you might be close to a uh, cutlet site. Um, one thing to note too, is that there's a new, uh, and this is a work that we've collaborated uh, with John Farrell on, um, the, uh, the, the essentially um, invasion of tube nose goby, which is related to the round goby from the same, uh, they originate from the same area in the Ponta Caspian area. Um, much slower um, rate of distribution increase throughout the Great Lakes compared to the round goby, but they've essentially finally made it into um, the uh, Saint Lawrence, upper St. Lawrence River 
um, back in, I think 2011 was the first sighting. And then really in 2016, they started to show up in uh, larger numbers in the, the Thousand Islands. And through our, our surveys in the Canadian side, at least, we've noted that they've really expanded uh, downstream. And on the top right map there in 2018, you can see those green stars show where we found this uh, tube nose goby in the Thousand Islands. And all the red dots are, are locations that were surveyed that year, but no tube nose were caught. And then in 2022, uh, last year, you can see all the green stars show where the tube nose was caught. So really, essentially, almost all the, the sites we go to now have uh, a really high probability of finding tube nose all the way down. And uh, the Quebec surveys, uh, near shore surveys last year, found tube nose in Quebec waters for the first time as well. So they're, they're, they've definitely expanded. Matt, we're losing the audio, so uh, we'll just check on that, okay? In the meantime, I, I wonder if, while we're waiting for Matt to get back up on board, uh, do we want to call on Colin to uh, maybe get started with his presentation, and we can maybe finish with Matt uh, towards the end? We'll just change the schedule up a little bit so that we're not losing anybody because we've got this temporary pause. How's that sound? Colin, do you want to come up? Yep, sounds good. Okay, thanks. I'll just mention, uh, it hadn't occurred to me to uh, to bring this up, but uh, John spoke about um, Water Soldier and the concern uh, with that new invasive species. I think everyone's seeing the right the right screen there. Um, I'll just mention um, we've been working uh, really closely with uh, with Parks Canada um, and other agencies uh, to track the movement of the species, the expansion, as John said, um, unfortunately, into the Upper Bay of Quinte. Um, and there's there's a lot of work being done. Um, Parks Canada has been working really hard up in the Trent Severn. Um, and we've been collaborating very closely with them. So um, we're also doing some eDNA work um, that Matt spoke to, um, looking for fish is our, our, our main interest, but also expanding that into water soldier. Um, there's drone work being done um, by Parks Canada. There's mechanical harvesting, chemical treatments. Um, it's all on the table. So um, it's very much on the radar of, of our agency, as well as a number of others, and uh, a lot of work's being done. So um, yeah, it's a, it's a good mention there, John. Uh, if I'd thought of it, I could have incorporated it in my talk, but uh, I just wanted to point that out. And I'll, I'll put this link in the chat, and um, you can look that up for yourself. There's some really good information there. Um, through the Invasive Species Centre, which is located in um, Sault Ste. Marie. Um, we provide some funding uh, to that to that group as well. Um, and there's some Ontario uh, fact sheets. If you scroll down to the bottom of the page there, um, you can see a fact sheet for Ontario, um, including identification and some of the biology of, of the species. I will get on to the talk here. I'll just check is how's that look for folks am I looks good Colin okay um, I'll keep my camera on for the, the meantime uh, until uh, unless uh, quality degrades or something I, I think the bandwidth should be good I came down to work to take the call um, for some reason I'm the only person here so I've got uh, I've got the internet all to myself so um, anyway first of all thank you very much uh, for the invitation to speak today I'm really excited about this program um, and uh, congratulations to John uh, on the recognition. Um, very well deserved. So I'm going to give a quick overview here of our new program, uh, the Spring Muscalunge Netting Program. Uh, I'll give you a very, very quick uh, overview of last year's uh, outcomes, results, and then a little bit about uh, our planning that's going forward for this year. Um, just for those of you who don't uh, 
don't know our, our uh, work unit, um, we're with the uh, Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, specifically the Lake Ontario Management Unit, and we're located at Glenora. You can see at the center of the screen there, and then the inset photo is uh, the building we're, uh, we're very fortunate to work at. Um, Steve works here, as do I, and a whole lot of other colleagues um, with the Lake Unit. Um, there's about 15 of us on permanent staff. Our numbers double. Uh, Right around now, actually, we're starting to really gear up. Um, it's an exciting time to be here at the station. Um, lots of programs, lots of uh, young technicians coming back to work and contract staff, and, and our numbers pretty much double. Um, you can see some select photos there, some of the work we do, and then a staff photo there at the bottom at, uh, on the Jack Christie, a, a new research vessel uh, here at the station. Just a reminder, um, for Ontario anglers, you're well familiar with Zone 20. That's that's basically the area we manage, uh, the fish communities and fisheries. So the Canadian side of Lake Ontario, as well as the St. Lawrence River. A little bit on uh, last year's program, uh, the spring survey. Uh, 2022, of course, was the first survey conducted by uh, LOMU, specifically targeting adult muskellunge. Uh, it ran for four weeks, basically, as you can see there, the entire month of May, um, 15 total net nights. And our, our very simple goal is to get our hands as many fish as possible and, and kind of work the kinks out of this new program. Um, I've, I've spoken, I think, to many of you before. Um, we've got a lot of experience here uh, with this sort of entrapment gear, this sort of survey work. Um, but it's the first time working in this area at this time of year. So uh, there's some learning to do. Um, we did catch muskellunge in, uh, in week one, week two, and week four. Um, I'll just point out week three was the only week I wasn't out, so I'm, I'm pretty much convinced that uh, I'm, I'm a good luck charm or something. So um, my, my plan is to uh, be out for every week um, this coming year, so we'll see if that holds true. Um, kind of by the numbers, just a real quick overview there. You can see the four weeks. Um, we used both hoop nets. Um, some people call them fike nets. Um, as well as trap nets. And uh, the, our trap nets, our six foot trap nets are very similar um, to the ones that Dr. Farrell and his lab use, which is nice. Um, so the, the data are pretty comparable. Our fishing effort is very uh, comparable. And you can see there uh, through the various weeks, the combination of both hoop and trap nets um, totaling 76 net nights. Um, the hoop nets didn't catch, didn't catch any muskellunge. Um, I'm not sure yet if we're going to use them uh, this coming year. We may take a few. Um, you can get hoop nets into pretty shallow sites um, that you can't otherwise get into with a trap net. So um, I haven't met yet with the technical staff. So I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking for their input and thoughts as well. Um, real quick summary by the numbers. You can see this is sorted by uh, species. So the most abundant species we caught was rock bass. And you can see the breakdown between the hoop nets and the trap nets. Um, Northern pike, uh, quite abundant, um, nearly 300 of them caught. Uh, muskellunge, you can see we caught six there. Um, and just on the, on the right-hand side, um, as anglers, you know, temperature's uh, one of the most important things you can measure um, when you're looking at fish abundance and distribution. And you can see, um, working through May, that uh, the water was starting to warm up from about seven degrees at the start um, to just over 12 uh, close to 13 by the time we were done. And I've just plotted our pike catches there along the bottom and uh, how they moved with temperature. So, uh, you know, the challenge here, we only have one year of, of data, so it's it's hard to draw a lot of uh, conclusions, but um, we're really, really excited about getting out again uh, this spring. Um, John spoke to catch per unit effort, so I quickly threw that data in there too. And you can see Again, muskellunge, we didn't catch any in our, our hoop nets, um, but we did catch six in our trap nets. So our catch per unit effort is, is just above 0.1, uh, which I noted is, is kind of in the ballpark of, of some of the data that John saw. So, um, you know, I think that's not too bad for our first year, uh, first year's effort. Um, just a reminder of how we pick some of our sites. Again, being the first year, um, it was a bit of a challenge deciding where to go. Um, we do have this long-term data set um, that we've contributed to, um, other MNR staff, um, Thousand Islands National Park, 
Um, this is the, the uh, YOY Muscle Lunge Saning Program. Uh, Muskies Canada was, was involved heavily in this in the mid 2000s um, and still remains involved to this day. Um, so this is just a big map of, of all the sites where sains were done and uh, the colored circles correspond to a year when at least one um, YOY musk lunge was caught. So it gave us some place to, uh, to start looking uh, in terms of where we might want to set our trap nets. And our center, our base of operation was Clark's Marina. Um, so fairly central, um, just, uh, just outside again in Aukway. Um, they were really good to us. Um, our plans to go back there again this year and work out of uh, the same location. Um, so from that previous map of all the possible places we could go, um, we, here's the sites we tried. Um, some places we fished more intensively. Um, we did get down to Wolf Island, you can see there, down in the western end. Um, that was a pretty long run. Um, really nice habitat. We didn't catch any muskellunge there. Um, but uh, I'm going to speak to our technical staff and get some input. Um, and see, uh, you know, see what their thoughts are. We, we do have a couple spots where we, we did catch musk lunch. So um, we're kind of at that early stage. We don't have our, our index sites established yet. We're kind of still roving. Um, so still more work to do, but uh, really excited to get out. Um, as I was saying to, to John, uh, you know, our, our technicians, uh, they're, they're pretty competitive. So I've, I've got some new staff assigned to this project this year. Uh, really excellent technicians, and uh, they're, they're determined die, to beat last year. Like so that. that's uh, they want to they want to do better than last year. So. Um, so plans for 2023. Um, first of all, our our program is going to be extended by a week. Um, so five weeks basically into early June. Um, that's 19 net nights. We may go to 100% trap nets. Um, don't know yet. I don't want to get ahead of our, our technical staff's input. We still have to meet and do a startup meeting. Um, as I said, we have a couple of go-to spots uh, where we did have success last year, um, but we're going to continue to look for um, for other sites, uh, perhaps that be, could become index sites. And as I mentioned, we're planning on working around Gananoque. Um, Wolf Island's a bit of a long run. We're going to Kind of wait and see whether obviously determines a lot of uh, uh, our decisions when we're out there but the the real goal here is to maximize the number of net nights maximize our effort uh, and and uh, as i say try and beat last year's numbers um john mentioned uh the telemetry work uh and the acoustic tags so um we've been in close contact with with john and and uh, we will be attempting to put some tags in fish this year um so excited about that, uh, contributing to uh, sort of the larger efforts going on. That's really uh, all I've got. That's a photo of one of the fish we got uh, last year swimming away, um, healthy and happy, or at least healthy. I don't know how happy it was, but it swam away nice and strong. So uh, we're looking forward to uh, another program this year and uh, getting our hands on more fish. Any, uh, any questions? Colin, I, I'm interested in, uh, you know, we could send you a comparison of our like hoop versus uh, Oneida type trap net catch. Um, I was just looking at the data quick and we we picked up at least two of our four fish and hoop nets last year. Okay. So, yep. um, you know, I uh, there's a lot of data. So if that would help in your your decision, I kind of like the Oneidas, but it is nice to um you know, when you get those low water years, um, it's sometimes tough to uh, get Oneidas in. And, uh, you know, we, we seem to do pretty well, but I have to take another look at like, uh, if there's really uh, like a, a difference. Um, you know, I think the biggest difference is the habitat that you uh, are able to fish. So, yeah. um, but I, I, you know, I could supply that if that would help you guys make a decision. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I expect, at the very least, we'll probably take the gear with us. At least you've got it then on hand. And if if we need it, we can run back and grab it. So um, like I say, there's no, I haven't made any decisions yet. And it's a, it's a team effort. So um, that information would be great. Um, cool. I'll, I'll try to do that for you. 
they are they are a little quicker to uh, to fish and reset. So there's that too. It's 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 not a huge commitment of time. So, yep. I think you got a hand up. Hello. Yeah, I have a question. It has has that been any studies on deep water muskies, the ones that stay deep and spawn off shoals, as opposed to trapping the shallower running muskie? Certainly, uh, Dr. Farrell's done a lot of that work. Um, I'm, I'm not going to answer for him. I'll just say the trap nets do fish to a certain depth. Um, we, we can fish them a little deeper. The, the lead length is really what determines how far offshore you can, you can get. Um, and the site characteristics, sort of the slope and the depth. But um, we do record uh, the depth of all of our nets. So um, I didn't present that here today. Um, but I would say on in general, we're we're probably certainly less than 20 feet um, depth kind of at, at the box at the at the end where we're, we're actually capturing the fish. But but John, I'll let you speak to uh, to deep spawning fish. Yeah, you know, we've we've got some information on that. We a long time ago, we did a study where we put out um, egg traps um, all over the, the bottom. And uh, we included uh, deep water, and uh, we did detect deep water musky spawning. But the the vast vast majority of spawning was occurring uh, probably less than a, a two meters, meter and a half. Um, so we it, it, it's interesting to bring that up because I was going to ask Colin about the northern pike because where we do see excessive amounts of deep spawning is with northern pike, ironically. Um, and that that's a long story. We kind of found a relationship between um, habitat change and water levels that are promoting this deep water pike spawning that we we kind of have a hypothesis that it's maladaptive because it doesn't seem to produce a lot of young. Um, so I was going to ask, uh, you know, if that answers the question and ask Colin uh, if he saw a pike that were in spawning condition, you know, throughout the musky spawning period. Yeah, no, that's that's a good point, John. Yeah, so we um, we did record um, length, uh, weight, and and condition of all the pike we handled. So um, it's it's a, a really nice added bonus to this program. We we are concerned about northern pike, uh, as are a lot of other agencies. So we are gathering data on pike as well. Um, we're not doing any tagging on them or marking, but um, certainly we've got all the data and. and Obviously, we can we can share it with you, John. Great, thank you. It, it you know it, it's always surprised me how, how we get the bulk of our catches during the muskie. Like we we have a uh, near shore pike spawning index going on right now. It, it ran all week, and uh, it's uh, the catches have been um, really poor this year. Um, and uh, when we set the muskie nets, invariably we catch a lot more than we do during the. Uh, tributary spawning index for pike like in March and April yeah and it seems to have shifted that way you know so it's uh different it's one of the I think it's one of the changes in the river so that's great you're getting that data yeah we don't um I mean we we, we have lots of other uh fisheries assessment programs um some of them using trap nets a lot of them are gill nets uh, surveys and it's not the best uh, gear for sampling pike we certainly get them and we can make some inferences you know, over decades, but uh, it's it's not what you'd use if, if uh, pike was your main target. So, um, like I say, this is a really nice bonus uh, to this program as to getting a, a bit of a handle on what pike are doing. So, oh, and you got another hand there. You also have a question in the chat too. I don't know if Brian wants to read that or I can. Just around Canadian anglers participating um, in the tagging and maybe what their contact is there, how we were doing that. Yeah, so there there were Canadians participating, John. I I I don't want to hand all the work over to you, but that's that's more in your ballpark there. Yeah, so that I guess that would be referring to the citizen science program that started last year, and um, you know, Colin has been a big uh, part of uh, helping us be able to uh, make that a binational effort. So uh, that's what's really unique about that program, and. Um, so Canadian anglers uh, were participating in angling or tagging muskellunge last year. 
Um, and uh, if people are, you know, interested, uh, they can reach out um, to us, and uh, you know, we can provide more information. And um, you know, we, I, as I mentioned in our my presentation, we'll probably uh, be planning another uh, workshop this summer. Does that answer your question, Bruce? And then, oh, make uh, pin tag readers available so purchase contribute data. Yeah, so the kits uh, include, uh, we have 10 kits right now dedicated to uh, Canada. And um, I think uh, there's still some available, um, but we're kind of, uh, you know, making sure that we get, uh, you know, anglers that receive the training and that spend a significant time out there um, and and maybe they could uh, you know team up with uh, anglers that have um, kits and training to check it out. So hopefully that helps answer your question, Bruce. He says yes, thanks there, John. And we have a hand up too. Who's got the hand? Go ahead there. Yeah, it's just a, back a little to 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 the actual habitat of of the muskie in 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 historical muskie spawning grounds that no year the young have been found because of the droughts it suffered or shoreline development and that's destroyed the the proper weed growth and everything else that the muskies require is it possible to rehabilitate those historic spawning grounds um I'm, I'm not uh, as familiar with, with specifically with musky restoration, but certainly there is instances where uh, aquatic vegetation has been planted and there's been work done like that. It's, it's generally far better to protect it before you lose it, of course. Um, now, I know, again, to defer to Dr. Farrell's work, there's been a lot of work done in, in um, sort of embayments and, and uh, shoreline, uh, coastal marshes and things like that. Um, to do some restoration. It's it's a big piece of work though, um, to say the least. Uh, yeah, for sure. Just to add to that, I mean, I think the the fry stocking program, you know, we had the, a baseline that was established in the 1990s that were that was prior to uh, round goby introduction. Um, I think zebra mussels were just getting started and, uh, you know, uh, a lot of the other river changes and you know, we had exceptional, uh, it was a five, five year study and it included habitat. And, um, you know, that really serves as an important, uh, baseline. And now we're repeating that to kind of, you know, not just help restore, uh, these lost spawning and nursery sites, but also kind of gauge the health of the habitat. And, and Matt, you know, he gave a really nice, uh, overview of, uh, you know, their, uh, very advanced, um, uh, assessment uh, program and, and monitoring habitat. So there's a lot of people that are focused on it now. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's aquatic plants, which provide the structure for the, the fish to use, but there's also like uh, ecological community, fish community level things that have changed, like in the prey fish populations and, you know, the presence of gobies and then the disease. Um, so, but, you know, the the good news is is we put these little tiny 25 millimeter muskies out in the river and quite a you know a number of them survived and uh did really well um so you know the habitat's still functioning i just want to point out that we got matt back welcome back matt and uh i do want to make sure that we kind of get through your presentation we got about uh half an hour left in the program so uh if you could uh probably conclude yours and then we'd use remaining time for questions if that makes sense peter sounds good uh, my apologies too I, we've lost power where i am so uh <laughs> you know <laughs> it's issues happening here i keep coming in matt glad to have you back thank you yeah i apologize for that sir it's uh there's just a little power outage here that just rebooted everything <laughs> so it's a little slow getting back online so um Glad there's still time to talk about the Muscalunge highlights, actually. And um, Colin, I'm sorry I missed your, your presentation there. So maybe I can catch up on it uh, on the recording afterwards, because I was really keen to see um, some of those results and discussions as well. Uh, right, so we were kind of left off here. Um, I was talking about some of the, uh, the background fish community catches we had from 2020, 
2022. Um, the nice thing to report is we're not finding anywhere near the, the numbers that um, uh, Tibbs is finding in Thousand Islands, but um, we, we did find a record number for our project last year, which is a nice sign. It's a nice trend. Uh, we found uh, seven young of the year muscalunge uh, across the sites, and then um, I'll show some pictures of some additional ones as well. Um, and through actually a donation from Muscat Canada, we, we did acquire a new pit tag scanner in, and just being aware of the um, the uh, all release of the the uh, juveniles, we were tagging larger or not tagging, sorry, we were scanning um, larger individuals for pit tags. Just as a curious thing, but we, we didn't find any, unfortunately. But um, that would have been maybe unusual to see some move across the river from the U.S. sites to the Canadian sites. But um, it's something we'll, we'll continue to do, just with the thousands of fish out there now. It's, the tags. It's definitely a good idea to continue to monitor for that. Um, yeah, so it, it was a great year for us actually, because uh, in 2021 we only found one young of the year muscalunge, so it's uh, they, they remain very rare across all the sites. Um, so last year we we revisited nine uh, sites where we'd previously found young of the year muscalunge, and of the nine, uh, one site did yield one individual. Um, and then we had four new uh, nursery sites discovered um, through other sites last year as well. And um, in addition to the FINS project surveys, um, as I mentioned, the River Institute does lots of other research on the river, including um, contaminant, uh, uh, contaminant surveys and analyses of fish communities, uh, particular sport fish. And through some of that survey work in the fall, um, an additional three YOI were found, uh, some larger individuals, and those were all clustered around uh, Cornwall. So there's some new sites there as well, which is great. And that, that kind of extended past the uh, usual end date of our FINS project. So it was kind of nice to see some larger individuals um, documented through that program. You see some photos of them right there. And again, scanned and no, uh, no pit tags found. Uh, a really interesting thing to note is that the fish community uh, is really uh, tends to be. Uh, higher diversity, more, more species at nursery sites for muscalunge compared to other sites across the river. So that's really nice. Um, uh, it includes co-occurring species at risk, uh, such as a pug nose. Uh, unfortunately, it also um, includes co-occurring uh, brown goby at almost all the sites. We also found uh, tube nose goby at several of the sites as well, that, that new invader in the river. And you can see uh, um, the uh, fish here there with a nice, Diversity of fish there, typical of a muscalunge site. This this survey, actually the one I'm holding the, the viewer here, this is right next to the river institute. So we had to travel um, about 50 feet to go catch that muscalunge, which is a great uh, cost def effort for that uh, survey. John's mentioning others, I'm sure Colin probably did as well. The, the issue last year, um, and actually in 2021 as well, is low water levels um, continue to be. Uh, having impacts on on some of these nursery sites. So this this site you can see here, you know, the huge extension extent of um, the bottom of the river is exposed here. And this is actually a, a nursery site that where we've documented um, by a live muscle engine in the past. So we didn't document any at this location in 2022. Uh, we did, we did do the survey a little further out in deeper waters, but it still just goes to show the impacts of uh, lower water levels both in terms of reducing the um, amount of nursery habitat, but also just altering the quality of it too, because it's shallower, um, it'll, it warms up more quickly. So it changes the thermal regime of the, uh, the nursery a little bit as well. And this just shows that, uh, this is from the IJC water levels uh, uh, website where you can see uh, 2021 and 2022 highlighted here and sort of near the, the record low levels documented for Lake St. Lawrence uh, those two years. So especially extending into July and August, it was, it was really, really low. Uh, over the course of the eight, last eight years, uh, our FINS project has documented a total of 26. So again, nowhere near the hundreds uh, documented in the Thousand Islands uh, by Tibbs and parts Canada, but um, it, it's, they're, they're very rare essentially in, in the Canadian waters. Um, and this just goes to show the the ongoing issues with improvement. Um, so we've documented a total of 17 nursery sites, and that's out of 230 sites sampled uh, across the Upper St. Lawrence River and uh, into Lake Ontario. 
And this just shows um, the, the numbers over time. So we did have a slight bump in 2022. Um, 2021 was uh, very poor throwing though for um, IOI. So there's this fluctuation over time. And this map here showing um, all of our uh, nursery sites from 2017 to 2022. And uh, they're just represented by those stars there. So green stars are three you know, prior ones and then red stars are ones that were actually um, confirmed in 2022. And the black dots are just all the, uh, the sampling sites over the years. Uh, key, key things, and this just confirms uh, what a lot of other research uh, has shown that John and other researchers in terms of the habitat characteristics preferred by young of the year. It's clear water, uh, heavily vegetated, and in particular certain species of aquatic vegetation, such as uh, Valsinaria, also known as tape grass or wild celery. Um, they, they tend to really like that and at the sites we found them at least. Um, but you can really see why in this underwater picture, they really blend in with that type of vegetation or, Ideally, uh, camouflage is in particular from above. Um, they, they just look like another piece of uh, tape grass, essentially. But clear water as well, and then sandy bottoms. And, and these characteristics are favored by several species of risk, including pugnose shine or two. So it really goes to show the importance of documenting and, and protecting these nursery habitats because of the um, rich biodiversity, species of risk, and also um, just acting as nurseries for musculunch. Um, something to note too, we, we have out of our 17 sites, only three of them have ever been um, multi-year survey successes. And that, you know, we, we re revisit sites on a yearly basis, uh, many of them, and um, only a handful actually, we have confirmed only three um, uh, finding muscalunge um, across years. And the sites uh, that are highlighted there are just ones that we've uh, added in 2022, those four new ones. So they, and those were all sites that we've previously been visiting. So it just goes to show you can, it really pays to return to the same sites. Um, if you believe that it's good conditions for a muscle nursery, even if you don't find them one year, it doesn't mean that you won't find them in a subsequent year of, of surveys. I also wanted to go over some of our Northern Pike highlights too, just another exhausted uh, finding. So we only found uh, 12 uh, last year. It was a little bit of a low number. Um, and that was from nine sites. Those were all previously documented nursery sites for um, year of the year uh, pike. And uh, this is some over the years, some stats here. So we've uh, documented 45 sites where we found um, young of the year, northern pike, and um, the majority of those are wetlands. So that's in contrast to the um, muscalunge nursery sites, which tend to be non-wetland sites. And the neat thing about the wetland sites, we've done some re recent research with some collaborators in uh, come back on this is that they they're showing um, resilience and uh, to the invasion by round gobies, so they they end up being these refuges of of um, habitat where round gobies are, are tend not to invade, and it's a combination. It's thought of, of the water conditions and the habitat conditions in wetlands are just not favorable for round gobies, so that's a good thing. Another really good uh, reason to protect wetlands um, for northern pike. Nurseries, and this is just our, our catch distribution over the years, showing this decline over the years in our uh, northern pike YOI catches, fortunately. And lots of uh, nursery sites. This is the same map of our uh, sampling area, and you can see all those green stars show all the, the northern pike nursery sites. So quite extensive, and um, they tend to match up really well with uh, wetland complexes throughout the river. Grass pickerel, we, we've barely caught any uh, in our eight years, and uh, all the, the fish we've uh, caught, um, oh, we've only found them at five wetland sites, and uh, we didn't find any last year either. So they they are extremely rare. Uh, I'm curious to know if others uh, have better success at catching them. Even if we go to sites where we, we it looks like perfect grass pickerel habitat, we uh, we tend to have trouble finding them, and our eDNA results are also uh, not picking them up very well either, unfortunately. So they, they're elusive on several fronts. What I'll do is just wrap up by talking about our next phase. Um, so our overall objectives of the project, uh, we really want to start including these emergent, um, emergent technologies such as uh, eDNA and drones more and more. Um, and we're using a system to understand a lot of these climate change impacts that are happening. So 
water level fluctuations, temperature. Um, this all is combined with other stressors such as a new invasive species, could be fish, could be uh, aquatic vegetation, uh, viruses, um, you know, just documenting trends over time in the fish community in, in relation to doc, uh, really accurately documenting the habitats and, and uh, communities that they inhabit. Um, we're really about building capacity at the River Suit and the uh, Mohawk Council of Aquasasini in terms of training young professionals to use all these new tools. Um, much the same way I know John's trained uh, generations of uh, graduate students as well that have gone great thing, um, great accomplishments. And we're, uh, we're doing that on a much smaller scale, but it's just really nice to see that capacity being built. Um, and just really working with as many partners and collaborators as we can. We relied on Queen's University for the uh, environmental DNA processing essentially for two years. And now we're, we're moving into a, a position where we can do that ourselves. But all this information too goes to government agencies, um, we, we do feed into, people request data from us all the time. If um, they're looking for species distributions or, or information, we, uh, we're very happy to provide that as well. And um, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, a really big mandate at the River Institute is communicating science to the public and um, answering questions. So we're, we're trying to use this data set to do that as well. In terms of specific muscle lens research objectives for this coming year, this field season, we're in a uh, fun, Part of the year in field planning mode, and uh, we're, we're going to be revisiting uh, nursery sites that are uh, are known and confirmed, and we're going to be uh, again applying eDNA and sampling as well to those sites. And we're we're going to be trying uh, several new locations that are have been reported from community members as uh, potential nursery uh, habitats in the Aquasasni area. We'll be doing a little more intense sampling in uh, the Lake St. Francis Aquasasni area this year. And uh, really monitoring that that spread of the new invasive uh, tube nose goby as well. Uh, we have this kind of eight years of, of baseline research uh, of these habitats, um, and many of them, you know, just last year the tube nose started to move in. So we're going to start probably to see some changes if, if there are changes, and we'll be able to compare that to what was there before because we have the baseline information. Uh, really, it's been a great project for research collaboration. I just listed a lot of universities here. Uh, of course, uh, John's here as well. Um, Queen's University is a big partner on this project. Uh, we've done some interesting partnerships with Toronto, uh, University of Toronto, uh, where they're using drones to collect water samples offshore, collect environmental DNA samples. It's so pretty cool. So you don't have to put a boat in the water or, um, you know, um, you can access more difficult conditions, essentially, habitats uh, using. Um, these types of new tools, so that's really neat. Um, collaborating with some people at McGill University on tube nose and round goby distributions and, and effects of thermal regimes on those. Um, and of course, sampling with the uh, University of Quebec at Trois Rivieres on the Lampsilis voyage last year. And, and we'll, we'll likely try to do that again this year with uh, uh, sampling the, the main channel of the river with environmental DNA samples. Um, a big one, too, of course, I can't forget is uh, Parks Canada. So. Um, we, we love collaborating with uh, folks there um, in Thousand Islands um, and with Muskie's Canada staff as well uh, every summer. So we'll, we'll try to set that up again this year. Uh, really grateful for all the funding support over the years. Uh, as I mentioned, we're, we're a nonprofit research institute. So uh, a big part of my job is writing research grants and uh, really grateful to all the support we've received over the years, um, in particular from Muskie's Canada. Um, some recent funding from them. So it's, it's gone a long way for, for us to support uh, the research we're doing, um, as well as a nice donation from uh, the Muskie uh, Symposium last year as well. This was really appreciated. I uh, just want to show some photos here too. You know, it's uh, there's a lot of um, help along the way too from folks. Uh, you know, uh, we, we visited John uh, Farrell and the Tibbs station back in 2016 and, and learned a lot from, from that experience and how to uh, designer methods um, and just you know to, to learn learn a lot about setting up a project and the bottom right of course you can see uh, Josh Van Reeren and Rob McRae uh, you know uh, regular collaborators out in the field um, and Peter you're in that photo that was a 2016 a little jaunt out on your boat there uh, I think it was a November trip but uh, just lots of support over the years you know uh, people on this call uh, John Anderson um, I think I saw Lisa there too it's uh, really nice to have that uh, support and, and Dav and you, know, you as well. Um, and uh, well, I've probably forgotten lots of people. Colin, of course, is uh, 
great at uh, helping us as well um, with the project. Uh, really would interested to hear from people. Uh, we do our best to try to find new nursery habitats uh, through sampling, but um, if people in particular have ideas about where a good site would be to, to sample, uh, we'd love to hear that from you. Um, and we can go confirm that with some of our survey work as well. So I've listed some of uh, my contact information there. Um, you can also follow us on uh, social media and also have a, a website too. You can check out with some story maps that are uh, kind of interactive and um, show them some nice visuals of the project. So thank you everybody. And, and sorry again for that disruption in the presentation. Hopefully uh, no one else had lost power there, but uh, happy to answer any questions. Yeah, I'm not seeing questions in the chat. It's Brian uh, here. Uh, we lost Peter along the way. So Peter also got announced. We're going to try to get him back in. Uh, if you've got questions, uh, you know, feel free to uh, just go on mic, raise your hand or uh, enter it in the chat. We'll try to catch it. Sure. And I'm not seeing I've it. got I've got questions yep. in that. I was just waiting sure, to say that. <laughs> so this is John. Um yeah, it was really uh you know, uh, that's awesome data that comparison of your fish community from Saint and Catch to EDNA um with the uh with the work you guys have been doing. So it's uh but it was interesting on the that that small data point on the the muscalunge um you know with you know it's interesting how we had uh like uh detections and i think it was 10 out of 11 we only did our 11 index sites and then uh you guys found like uh um only a few sites and then you had the one uh misdetection i just wondered what what do you what your what you think's going on with that I, with the yeah. It's a good question, right? You know, if it's if it's only small individual wild wide area, and if they're really low density, it could just be that the water samples just, you know, they're spread out enough that it, the uh, the DNA isn't being captured in that sampling. Um, the way we do it is we take three triplicate samples at a site that are spread out, spatially spread out. So we we try to kind of cover hedge our bed a little bit in terms of covering the. the the area of the site um, with the sampling, but uh, I, yeah, I, I don't know. I I, I know um, you know from from earlier presentations, you've had much better luck in, in documenting, confirming the the known sites with eDNA. So it's been um we're we're in the process right now of um, running all of our 2021 and 2022 samples through our new qPCR unit. So I'm wondering if that gives us a little bit better accuracy or better hits essentially on the uh, the DNA versus a meta barcoding, which is, you know, it's, it's great to show the community blast um, results that way, but maybe not as good for specific species uh, detections. Mm -hmm. From what I understand, you know, it's, it's a new tool that I'm learning more about, but yeah, I think um, that, that could be something that we get better results using the qPCR. Yeah, thanks. I, you know, one one difference is is our data was collected during spawning, so it, it focuses on adults, you know. So maybe that's uh, part of it yeah. too. The adults obviously contain a lot more DNA, and um, yeah. and there's probably differences in the water uh, characteristics then too. But uh, yeah, you know, if you want to follow up sometime, I'd be interested. Yeah. I'm just thinking off the top of my head, an interesting study at some of your sites might be regular sampling over the course of a season, starting in spawning season, and then seeing how that, that signal may be, if it stays strong or if it does fade over time. Yeah. Yeah. The, you know, the, it's great, you guys, you have continuity with this. And, you know, we kind of sometimes do like a technological advancement um, through like a, a study or a project, but then, you know, it's harder to implement it into your you know, monitoring program to continue it. So I don't, I don't think we have any eDNA uh, work plan this year, for instance. So, okay. um, unfortunately, but so if you guys want to collaborate on anything, you know, since you guys are investing into uh, the future of it, 
you know, let me know because we have crews on the water and we we could send you filters or you know something like that to run. That would be fantastic. Yeah, that'd be great. So we can talk about, um, you know, our our samples. We weren't able to um, like amplify them to quantify the, you know, the number of reads and stuff like that. But the uh, uh, they were positive detections, but we, there wasn't enough material to amplify it. So. Okay. Um, that's about as far as we went. We, we just had a paper come out on the method uh, last month. Yeah. So, yeah, I saw that. It was a great paper. Yep. Yep. Thanks. I, I had a question for you, John, on the uh, the the stocking of the, the fingerlings. It, yep. it seems like a great way to overcome the potential, um, um, you know, limiting factor on recruitment from round goby predation on eggs you know you kind of skip over that step a little bit by i'm just wondering do you have a sense of what that how how much round gobies are potentially uh yeah that's know, a really limiting good, recruitment yeah it's a really good question and like all we have is that experimental study where we uh you know put uh in a really large i think it was uh 10 feet long and 20 you know in, in english 10 feet long and 20, two feet wide uh, tank and then we filled it with different substrates and we we put uh i think it was 30 eggs in, a, in something that large and then we put one goby in there and uh i we couldn't believe like even in complex vegetation 50 percent of the eggs were found in 24 hours in the in the goby you know and if, if there was less complex substrates it was 100 percent um so we you know but we weren't able to um uh, we, we need to do a field study. So it, it kind of was done in the lab. We were amazed at the, how they could sniff out the eggs. We have done field studies with, uh, you know, nest building species uh, and had a lot of success with that. And, uh, you know, we found that there was uh, also an assemblage of native species that eat eggs quite readily, <laughs> you know, so it's like there was a question of whether gobies were um, you know, replacing or additive in terms of uh, egg predation in the natural environment. Uh, and then you can go to things like, uh, you know, isotopes and other measures like that. But we really need to do uh, a field study. Um, you know, we, we've noticed that uh, I used to do that egg trapping uh, to look at natural um, spawning and uh, we were doing that with Northern Pike, and when the when the goby came in, uh, we we weren't catching any Northern Pike eggs anymore. So the I, I assume they were eating them, and mm -hmm. um, you know that uh, uh, survey stopped where we were deploying egg traps. So you know it's a big question because it, if if it's that intense, um, it, you know the restoration potential is uh, diluted because if we bring back spawning adults and they don't succeed. But that's why I'm so, you know, in, in, uh, it, it's great to see the natural reproduction that you're seeing like another spike this year so that the muskies are able to pull it off. And like you said, there's some buffering capacity uh, in, in the wetland environment. We see the same thing. No gobies up in the Drowned River mouths um, hmm. in the wetland environment. We do see them in the muskie habitat though. So yeah. they're, but there, it's kind of a, you know, there's a seasonal shift in goby distribution. So whether they're really, you know, we, we get these giant ones in the musky traps, uh, you know, that are 10 inches long and stuff. And they tend to be, I don't think they're the big egg eaters. I think they're more of a dracinid specialist. At least that's what the data was showing. So, but it's a great question. So I can't really answer it. I can dance around it, but, yeah, you know, so yeah. Um, obviously, you know, our, we're, you're seeing that big pulse in our numbers, and it's because of the fry and fingerling stocking. Um, you know, we our surveys are done uh, prior to the fingerling stocking, so it's all the fry effect. Mm -hmm. So that that's a pretty early life stage for a muskie to, you know, to fulfill. So we're in, we're also encouraged by that. Um, so, but it's great that you guys are kind of monitoring you know, full on natural reproduction, you know, assuming there aren't movements that you're looking for, but, uh, you know, and we're, you know, depending on a small sample of OTC marking kind of things, uh, 
so it's 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 really helpful that the fins program is kind of covering sites that aren't receiving fish so it kind of gives us a you know another important piece of information about natural reproduction do you I, one more sense. question on that and i'll, I'll uh, do you expect some of the uh pit tagged individuals to move across the, yeah uh, probably yeah. probably after they leave the embayments we you know the studies we've looked at like i showed you some of that growth data. So we're recapturing fish in the places where they were put so far. So we don't think that they're making big movements. I, I think you might remember that we worked with the Carlton group, uh, Sarah Walton and Steve Cook's group, and uh, did that. Uh, we did a study uh, with acoustic telemetry on uh, fall juvenile muskie. And, um, you know, they move around a lot, but they weren't like leaving they weren't moving like more than, you know, hundreds of meters, not like kilometers. So it looks like they're staying pretty close and then probably they reach uh, some critical size where they begin to uh, feel safe and wander into the river. And that's probably when they might make bigger movements. Um, but uh, hopefully that um, acoustic array will help reveal some of the those patterns over time. Um, was Gananoque one of the stocking sites too? Or did I see that on the map? No, there's been no stocking in Canadian waters. We do, okay. you know, we are we are stocking though in some sites like on the backside of Grindstone and um, you know, places where the river's pretty narrow down in Lake St. Lawrence that that were very close to Canada, like a stone's throw. So um, you know, we don't think that the species is abiding by the the international border. So <laughs> that'll be another interesting thing to see if, uh, you know, there's mixing going on on both sides or if there's like such tight, tight fidelity to where they were released that they don't deviate. But I kind of doubt that's going to happen. I think that's more typical of like pike. Um, and then, okay. yeah, I want to like uh, not to dominate, but the uh, your pike data is really interesting on the young of the year. So you, there were two spikes in there. 2017 and 2019, we saw the same thing. Okay. And uh, you know, you know what uh, those years are, right? Those are the floods. So, you know, yeah. it's, it's, it's very uh, um, reaffirming to me about the importance of, uh, you know, water level and, and uh, you know, recruitment of uh, that species. So, you know, we saw the same exact thing, huge, huge spikes in the wetlands uh during those two years so it's nice to see that in your data so i think you're yeah. capturing you're capturing the, some of the processes you know there's very there's some interesting consistency in our oh our data sets um, yeah you know, have that. you seen oh, water so soldier we're, gonna, we're, we're running out of time yeah. oh, yes sorry good chat I, I feel we should get you guys over lunch uh and i know we we've lost our uh, we lost our moderator with peter he's down robert's going to make some concluding remarks i think and then if there's any uh follow-up that people want to have we can keep the line open okay uh i do have something uh, real real quick and this is uh for colin and john uh just uh, i'm going to send an email to you in reference to the saint lawrence river and uh the information that normally we would uh, collect for expired muscalunge because I do want to get that out a little bit uh, further dispersal than just our little group here. That's important. Uh, also in talking to, uh, <laughs> uh, it will take a couple of days before the link is out for this event in particular. It's going to be mailed to everybody that's uh, that's online and then it'll be posted. I, I believe we've got that uh, uh, Brian, you'll be able to post that uh, so people can start uh, dipping into it. We'll probably uh, look at pushing it through the Muskies Canada outlet so they've got hand handles on it. Uh, as we close, I do have a closing statement here. As we close the uh, 2023 St. Lawrence River Muskie Angling Workshop, I wanted to express my sincerest gratitude to Dr. John Farrell, Matt Wendell, and Colin Lake for lending their valuable time and shared their expertise with us. It, it's very important. These events are very important. Their presentations were both revealing and engaging. We all learned valuable information that can be helped help conserve these great fish. I would all, also like to express my appreciation for Peter Lebec providing his guidance on implementation. We've been at this for a couple of years now. And of course, uh, Brian Lambie uh, and Red Brick Communications for helping us host this event. 
hopefully we can lean on you a little bit there next year. Uh, to our fellow participants who joined us today, thank you for taking the time to come out on this Easter weekend. Your contributions are essential to making this workshop successful. On a personal note, and I am a son of the watershed and I started my embarkation here in 1964 with my first experience picking up garbage in 1965 off the beaches. There are some significant changes. I follow this along and I look into the future. It's what I was trained to do, doing my old job. And these changes are, they have me a little bit concerned. And these are the influences of what's happening in Canada and what's happening in the US and support for programs like uh, pledge to clean up the Great Lakes and of course, natural or marine conservation areas. These are gray spaces to us anglers and we don't understand enough about them. These changes must be met with education and not speculation. And that's how come we bring the experts out. As an angler, I can conceive ideas. I've been on the road, I've been on the water now for 15 years supporting programs with Parks Canada. So I got a pretty good idea. We got our, we got our finger on the pulse here. But we got to educate our people. We got to educate the anglers. It's the only way that we're going to get this moving forward. It will be up to the angling community to position themselves where they can provide the greatest effect and that's supporting the sciences that are happening on the water. In closing, let us commit ourselves to the betterment of the Musqueamish population in the upper St. Lawrence River. Let's promote responsible, responsible angling and environmental stewardship for the benefit of all. Uh, thank you and all the best in 2023. And I will be hanging around to field any questions if you have them. Cheers, over to you, Brian. Great, we'll leave the channel open for a bit. Uh, if people want to just sort of mingle, there's uh, no rush. I'll uh, I'll just have it in mute mode. And and again, thanks to everybody for their participation today. Thank you. I have to run to an Easter parade right now, uh, but uh, really <laughs> great to, to see everybody. And uh, <laughs> um, uh, please reach out if you have any uh uh, thoughts or want to chat further and, and John and Paul and I'll be in touch uh, soon too. Yeah, let's let's follow up, Matt. That'd be great. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Thanks John. Stuff, Matt. Thanks. Thanks, everybody, for that awesome honor. I look forward to working with the group in the future. Really John, appreciate everything. Yeah. John, you, just so uh, you're aware, uh, I will be delivering that over to you uh, when we take our next training adventure. So I do have that here for you. <laughs> Got your name on it. It's beautiful. Uh, focus. It's, <laughs> be, be yeah, we'll set that up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks so much. It's it's great, Rob, and look forward to seeing you guys. Good luck, good fishing, everybody. Thanks, John. Thanks, John. Take care. Yeah, good to see you, Lisa. See you guys. Bye. That's it. No, there's your backup here.